So um, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the uh, finals of the Red Eagle competition. There were originally 15 teams. We down selected to five finalists who are here today uh, to present their designs for a, uh, a lander that can deliver um, 10 ton payload to the Martian surface. Okay. The assumption is you've already been delivered on TransMars injection and you're approaching Mars and now you have to get 10 tons to the Martian surface. Um, we have uh, five teams. Uh, are the Red Movers from France here? Over there. Okay. Is Argo Nova from Germany and Sweden here? Over there. Okay. Is Gurdjaho from uh, India and Italy here? Okay. Um, is Icarus from the United States here? there. And Project Eagle from Poland. Okay, so all five teams are here. So um, each team is going to have a total of 40 minutes, but um, you should try to wrap it up in 30, so there's 10 for questions, and in any case, no more than 35, so at least five minutes for questions, which will be from the judges. Now, we actually have quite an eminent panel of judges. Uh, we have Paul Wooster, who is... Um, one of the principal engineers at SpaceX is here. Uh, Tony Muscatello who spent many years at NASA Kennedy Space Center. Um, Tara, I forget your last name. Halsgrove. What? Halsgrove. 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 Okay, and she's from Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, we have Hoppy Price, who's from Jet Propulsion Lab, um, and we have uh, Max. Bacon. Bacon. Yes, and I believe he's with Maiden Space at the moment. Okay, which is a private space entrepreneurial company. Um, not one of these corporate giants like SpaceX. But the, uh, okay. So, and then you're going to be judged. Um, 20 points for cost, 20 points for overall technical quality of the design, 20 points for minimizing total mass, 20 points for operational simplicity, 20 points for schedule. Um, did we give you a date that we wanted this thing to be available by? What was it? By 2026. So we cannot use levitation and stuff like that to land. You got it. Okay. Something that, that would be available by the middle of the next decade. Uh, in terms of uh, instructing the judges, the teams may say what their cost is, but it is up to you to decide what you think the co development cost of the technology is likely to be. Okay. Um, they may make their suggestion, but you know you, you can decide what you think is realistic and which costs less than each other, okay? Because some teams might give a more optimistic estimate, and it's your estimate that counts. So the order is going to be: uh, first, we're going to have the Red Movers from France, then the Argo Nova from Germany and Sweden, then Gurjaho or Gurjaho, whatever. Uh, how do you pronounce it? Gurjao from India and Italy, Icarus from the United States, and Project Eagle from Poland. So, without further ado, let's have the French team. We're the team from France, and this is going to be our take on trying to land 10 tons on Mars. So uh, we're a, three, a team sorry, of only three people. So there's uh, Leopold Combi, Anaïs Sabadi, and myself, Maxime Lenormand. And we've been uh, only three working on, on this project. So uh, to take a little moment just to talk about who we are, uh, we are three uh, aerospace engineering students that uh, come from the same school that's called IPSA, which is in Paris. And we're really interested and we try to be involved as much as possible in, uh, in space. So here are just an example of some of the things we've done. Uh, Leopold has won a European contest of making a balloon on Mars. And I myself has worked as a scientific host explaining uh, rocket science to the general public. And well, we took a part into this contest because we really want to be a part of the exploration of Mars. Uh, we were too young when there were the Apollo missions. 
and we were kids when the space shuttle was retired, we really want to see uh, the next big thing, which is sending humans to Mars. We really want to be a part of that, and so we'd like to take a moment just to thank the Mars Society for uh, having this contest and uh, allowing us to come, come here. So remind the rule of the contest, we have to, to design a tent on lander uh, launched by 2026. We have to make it as cheap as possible, possibly can send humans, and we have to make the mass lower as possible. <coughs> so we will present our project in four steps. Uh, first, we start by the technical aspect on what, the, what is the choice that we did do to arrive at this uh, result. And second time, we speak about the schedule and at the same time, the budget. And before to conclude, we speak, we give some information about the limitation of our project due to the fact that we are just free students. So to start off, um, the aim is to land 10 tons on Mars. So the choice that we take, took, sorry, was to take the space launch system to be able to put those 10 tons. So from the information we have, uh, an SLS launch would be half a billion about. And so to put 10 tons of payload, we're gonna s need to send much more than that with the mass of the lander. The issue is to be able to land uh, 10 tons, we're gonna need the SLS block two. And from what we saw, it's only available in 2029 for the first launch, and we wanna go there for 2026. So the idea we had is actually to make another lander, the same one, but a smaller version, that's gonna be able to launch, uh, to land six tons on Mars for a fraction of the cost. The launch cost is 150 million. And so we're gonna develop two landers, uh, one heavy for 10 ton, so that we're in the rules of the contest, and a smaller that's gonna be able to, to land, sorry, six tons on the surface of Mars. So you can see uh, two view of each landers. Uh, on the left part, the landers for Falcon EV, on, on the right for SLS. <coughs> uh, it's the same design, the same architecture, the only difference is the size. And by comparison with the other spacecraft cargo, we find that for six ton of payload, we need 35 cubic meter uh, for the payload of six ton. And for the payload of 10 ton, we should need 80 uh, cubic meter uh, for, the, for the SLS version. We chose to put the payload in the center of the lander to have the door closest possible of the ground to, to have an easy access to the mass, uh, mass ground. So we're just gonna take a moment to uh, take a look at our lander, how it, how it is. So um, this is when we're start, starting EDL. Uh, as you can see, we have an inflatable heat shield. It's a hypersonic, so high add. Um, there are lots of benefits to this. We have a higher uh, surface area, so it creates more drag, and it's inflatable so that it actually fits in the fairing. Uh, on the side, you can see some solar panels that are gonna provide all the electrical needs uh, during the six month flight there. Uh, we, we would. We were thinking of jettisoning them just before landing, so that's, uh, we don't have that much weight. Well, that's less weight to reduce. Uh, the landing legs, well, we took a little bit from what SpaceX does. You saw the picture uh, just before on when they were deployed. And you can see some RCS packs. Those are just for attitude control. Uh, what's interesting about those is that you have two at the bottom, you have, sorry, four at the bottom and four at top. And those at the top are inclined in 45 degrees so that uh, when the heat shield is deployed, the ejection, the gas ejected doesn't uh, hit the heat shield. So we still uh, remain, we still have uh, attitude control once the heat shield is deployed, which we're gonna need further on um, that we'll explain a bit later. To design our lander, we had to take in account the center of gravity with the best mass distribution as possible. So we choose to put the propellant on the top of our lander. Uh, we know it's not the easier way for development, but it's better for the center of gravity. Um, we, not, we have not to, to uh, put the center of gravity lower than uh, uh, up to three meters on the Falcon EV. So uh, to the launch, the lander is uh, upside down, so the, um, the, um, the center of gravity is lower the three meters. And then uh, after launch, the, the first part of the propellant is for the burning, uh, burning, uh, capture burn, sorry. <laughs> and the second part is for the landing burn. And then when the lander lands on Mars, the propellant is uh, empty, so the, 
they are just below the, the payload, so the center of gravity is as lower as possible. Sorry. So, um, what are the benefits of such choice? Why, why did we take uh, one lander and make two versions out of it when we just were asked to make one? Well, the first one is we still respect the rules of the contest, obviously. We're still able to land 10 tons. But we thought it's actually cheaper to do it like this. It's a bit more technical because instead of having one version, we're gonna have two, one for 10 ton and one for six tons, but it's cheaper. As we're gonna see later, for the same cost, uh, as we estimated it, we can do one launch with SLS, land 10 tons with SLS, or two, launch, two launches, sorry, with Falcon Heavy. And since one of the um, ideas to having such a heavy lander was sending lots of rovers to Mars in the first time to be able to explore Mars and uh, giving uh, ability for people, for example, to see Mars in VR, for the same cost, either we can send uh, 10 tons at one point, or 12 at one point, or even six and six at two different points, so we can uh, have rovers on different parts of Mars for the exact same cost. So this gives us more flexibility, uh, and this is why we did it like that. To design our lander, we use three main software. First, Kerbal Space Program, it's in initially a game, but we had some uh, extension developed by our space engineer who give a really good estimation of the trajectory for the Mars approach, and especially the air waking phases. And in the second time, for the Mars uh, atmospheric entry, we use AWS, it's a software developed by a French engineer, especially for the Mars uh, Society, who specialize in the uh, atmospheric entry on Mars. So thanks to these two software, Kerbal Space Program on AWS, we can simulate all the phases of our flight. And uh, at the end, we use ANSYS uh, Freehand, who is a CFD software, to find the parameter, parameter of our design, so the uh, drag coefficient and lift coefficient. Our first version, named Plume, like uh, it means feather in English, uh, it's uh, our SLS uh, lander. It can initially send uh, 40 tons on Mars and uh, at the land, uh, you can put a 10 ton payload. On this graph, you can see the deceleration during the uh, atmospheric entry. So on the left graph, it's the altitude in function of the time. On, on the right graph, it's the deceleration in function of the time. So you can see uh, at eight kilometer, we stop the deceleration when we drop the shield. And so the lander start to uh, accelerate and before the last uh, suicide burn. Uh, so you can see we are al al always above uh, minus two G of deceleration, except for the 10 last seconds when we have uh, minus five G of deceleration during the suicide burn. So it's still supportable for humans. Cool. Our second version named Colibri, it means uh, hummingbird. Uh, it put in Falcon Heavy, it can initially send uh, 16 and a half uh, tons and at the lens can put a six ton payload. Uh, one of the requirements was to try lowering the mass as much as possible. This has multiple benefits. Either you can put a bigger payload or it's cheaper and we went for the bigger payload. Um, so we're gonna do a, we wanna do an aerobraking maneuver, uh, especially for uh, the Falcon Heavy launched uh, spacecraft. Uh, the air braking maneuver, the way it's going to go is first we're going to do a circularized burn. So this puts us in a highly elliptical orbit. And at the apogee of that orbit, we're going to lower the perigee into the Martian atmosphere at about 100 kilometers. And that's where the air braking is actually going to start. Each time we're going to pass into the Martian atmosphere. So we deploy the heat shield at that moment. Uh, we're going to... Um, there's gonna be drag that's gonna be created. This is going to lower our speed and lower our apogee. And this is why um, we needed the uh, RCS at 45 degrees because our uh, design is unstable. And so if we want to be able to perform our braking correctly, we're gonna to need to have a lot of attitude control and we really depend on the RCS just to keep the attitude correctly and the uh, shields pointed towards uh, the atmosphere. And finally, we are going to continue that air braking maneuver until the lander falls onto Mars. Um, and then we're gonna perform EDL. Uh, we could have done an aero capture, but we thought this was technically more complicated as it's never been done before. So we, we prefer to stay on something more reliable that has already been done before. Uh, aero braking has been performed by four probes up to now. Um, to lower uh, an altitude, it's never been done for a lander yet, but 
we think it would be, it would be easily possible uh, to actually land something like this. And with the arrow braking maneuver, um, we gain about 1,000 meters per second of delta V, so that's a lot of fuel. And uh, we didn't do this for the crewed versions, uh, well, because we don't really want our astronauts to spend some extra time in space. They're already, already, already going to be there for six months. So air braking, it's, it actually means less stress on the vehicle because um, we're entering the atmosphere. You can see it on the graph on the left. At about 100 kilometers, we're going at Mach 20. And uh, on the other graph, for uh, dynamic pressure, you can see that there's basically no, uh, no stress on the heat shield. Most of it is during the descent, and we, can, we, we have a lot of control during the air braking, and then uh, we can do the EDL as, as smooth as we want. So now it's the same uh, phases for the two lander. We start the atmospheric entry. So for this, we use an hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic shield. Uh, we use it uh, above eight kilometers, and we drop it at eight kilometers of altitude before to start the suicide burn on the last retropropulsion phases. And we need to find, um, to land under zero kilometer of altitude, so it's a yellow, blue, and dark blue part on this map, to have enough uh, air atmosphere density and enough time to, to, to decelerate and to land safely on Mars. So we're just gonna walk you through the EDL. Um, this is the uh, Colibri lander, so the one that has performed the arrow braking maneuver. It would have been the si same with Plume, the heavier one. Uh, it would just have performed a burn uh, to enter the Martian atmosphere instead of arrow braking. So at about 90 kilometers, um, our entire orbit is inside the Martian atmosphere, if we can still call that an orbit. So we're going to slowly enter the denser parts of the atmosphere at about 55 kilometers. This is where the heat shield is actually going to start doing uh, all the work. At about 40 kilometers, this is where there's going to be uh, maximum thermal flux. And until we reach 20 kilometers, this is where it's, uh, we're going to reach uh, max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. At about 8 kilometers, of altitude, uh, the heat shield is not going to stop us much, and so it's just basically dead weight. So we don't want to slow that down anymore. So we're going to just jettison the heat shield so that we have the minimum mass we need to slow down. And uh, I just forgot to mention we have already uh, separated the um, solar panels just to get uh, the minimum weight to slow down. And finally, at about zero kilometers of altitude, at the very last moment, uh, we want to perform a suicide burn, so this is the um, most efficient way to land, so we're going to deploy the legs. Uh, the suicide burn is a great way to land something, but it's pretty risky, so just to make sure that uh, we don't blow up or anything, we went for more uh, fuel, ma whoop, sorry, we took a fuel margin of about 50% of the fuel requirement we need to do the suicide burn, so that we have a bigger margin uh, to land and so that we can land safely. And finally, we land at about zero kilometers or underneath to have enough time uh, to perform the, the burn. Our deadline is 2026. Uh, until this date, uh, the best launch window is uh, on November of uh, two, uh, 2026. Um, if we begin in, two, in 2019, we have uh, seven years uh, to to uh, develop our lander, it's similar to uh, to MSL mission. Uh, we spend eight years, so uh, we decide to base uh, on uh, this timeline. And uh, which um, Curiosity is the biggest payload uh, uh, spent on Mars uh, up to now. So we know that uh, MSL mission have a two year delay. Uh, when we analyze uh, more preci precisely. Uh, we can see that uh, payload needs a long time delay, represented by the, the red line. Uh, our line is, uh, other, other line are negligible, uh, besides the, the red line payload. So uh, we decided to put uh, two years and a half for the design and uh, the, the, the other years for the development, assembly and test. Uh, to develop all uh, parts separately and then assemble um, until the launch in November uh, 2026 and six months uh, after uh, the, the lander landing on Mars. 
So now we're going to talk about our cost estimates. Um, based on what we saw and the other projects that have been done, so these are mostly MSO and uh, from what we've seen, the cost development we think would be of about $1 billion. Once that is done, um, we can start um, sending the landers and this is where our two configurations come into play. Either we have Colibri sent with Falcon Heavy, we just estimated that the lander would cost about 300 million uh, to build and with a launch cost of about 150 million. So this means at the end we can uh, land six tons for about 450 million dollars. And on the other side, to be able to land 10 tons, uh, we have Plume sent by SLS, which is going to cost a bit more because it's bigger. So there's more structure and more fuel. And uh, this would be about 400 million. That's what we estimated. And the launch would be uh, about half a billion. So we can put 10 tons for 900 million. This is, this is the reason why we wanted to do it. If we want to send like a return vehicle or a very big hab that is 10 tons, then the SLS launch is, uh, is the, the option to go for. But if we have smaller payloads that can be broken down into things that um, can fit in six tons, then it's uh, more cost effective to send them uh, with the Falcon Heavy. And if for the same amount of money, again, we can have two launches, so 12 tons in total or 10 tons. <clears throat> so this budget is dispatched uh, on seven years by f on three phases, design, development, and operations. It's for the first launch. The second la launch, uh, we just have development and operational uh, operation phases. So uh, it's one billion. And if we take, for example, the international cooperation, like for the uh, International Space Station, uh, we can imagine that NASA just have to participate at 80% and 10% for the Russian agency and 5% 5 5 for the European agency. So if we, if we, have, generally, ge oh, sorry. If we have only 80% of the cost provided by NASA, it will represent uh, 800 million. So 800 million on seven years, it's only 0.5% of the NASA budget by year. So it's uh, quite reasonable for a space project. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to talk about the limits of, of this project. This was a lot of work, obviously, for us. And we think it's just fair to talk about uh, what we think are the limits, because that means we can show you what we're more confident about. And something like this uh, obviously has limits. The first thing is there's not that much studies out there that talk about sending big payloads uh, to Mars. And most of the studies are actually uh, done before uh, MSL, so before we had even sent one ton to Mars. On the technical standpoint, um, this is a very general concept, obviously, and we were just three. Um, our calculations are based on assumptions and approximations. We, are, we feel confident about the approximations that we have shown you, but again, these are not super detailed. Um, we had to use student accessible tools, obviously. Um, this is why uh, the software we use are only student versions, so we didn't go really into details because we just couldn't. And we, we couldn't do any hardware tests or anything. Everything is based on simulations. Uh, we tried to cross uh, the, plan, the different softwares we had so that we are sure that the um, simulations we have done are reliable because we have the same results on multiple platforms. And uh, one of the biggest uh, components that we use is the uh, inflatable heat shield. And this is currently under development. It has never been flight proven, uh, so we think it's gonna work. People are really working hard on it, but it's never been flight proven, so that's a big question mark about it. But it should be fine by 2026. It's no super future high-tech um, hardware. And finally, on the schedule and budget, well, there's no comparison. Never, nobody has ever landed 10 tons on Mars yet. And while we're engineers, we are engineering students, we're no financial experts or anything, so we think the cost estimations we have done are pretty good, but again, we're no experts. So now to sum up our project before the conclusion, uh, we can say we designed two lander, two possibility, one for six ton, we can send two for the same price, right, one for 10 tons. Uh, we used two different lenders, uh, thanks to the technical shows that we did, 
Uh, we have a simple solution, it's the same design, same architecture between the two lenders, just a question of size. And uh, it will cost one billion, and the advantage of these two solutions was uh, we are, that we are really adaptable. We want to thank some people for uh, the help. So first, Jérôme Daniel for his knowledge uh, on his program ARES, then Guillaume Duchesne for his uh, knowledge on KSP, and then Richard Edman on this room uh, for his uh, knowledge and all his advice for our project. Uh, we'd just like to conclude uh, saying that, um, well, just first of all, thank you for having us here. And uh, we really like, we really like to see uh, people on Mars, and we also want to be a part of the people that help send people there, or even actually go there ourselves. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, we'd gladly like to answer to them. Okay, um, I've got um, a couple of questions. Um, I'll, I'll answer, I'll, I'll ask them both, then you answer. One is a simple question. What kind of rocket delta V do you need to land falling from eight kilometers uh, to the surface uh, to, to deal with that? But then also, um, the other question I had, which was, um, on your vehicle, the, the plume, the small, smaller one, right? um, that was the, the six-ton lander, mm -hmm. it seemed like you had a rather long um, lander behind a relatively small aero shell. And then for the heavy lander, you had a, a rather short lander behind a, a bigger aero shell. Uh, my concern, my question is, what calculations did you do to make sure that the heat that is um, the, the hot gas that is coming behind the aero shell does not hit the lander um, and cook it? Okay, so first of all, the uh, delta V that we took for eight kilometers, if I recall, I think we took uh, 500 meter seconds, so that way we divide on 10 seconds, that's 5 Gs, so that's why it's totally doable for humans. And we took uh, additional 200, 250 meters of second uh, of delta V of fuel so that we can have a total of 700, 800 uh, meters per second of delta V of uh, fuel. And uh, the second question, the answer, uh, most of the dimensioning was done on CFD. So uh, we didn't look exactly into the heat that would be generated on top of the uh, on top of the lander, but from the results we had on the CFD, there were not that much air that was going back up. There was a uh, deep pressure, uh, like a lower pressure zone, uh, that was totally encapsulating the the lander. So we did not ha do any um, particular uh, thermal test on the whole lander, but based on the CFD, uh, we saw that uh, it would still be in a very low pressure zone. I don't know if that answers your question. For, for, for the uh, capture of the larger vehicle, uh, did you say that was propulsive capture with no, no arrow braking? Uh, yeah. Okay. For, for the crude, it's propulsive for sure because we don't want to spend more time. Okay. And then uh, I just wanted to clarify that one. Uh, for the, the studies you did, did you look at uh, direct entry? Um, so you, you ruled out aero capture because it had not done, been done before, but uh, I was wondering if you also looked at direct entry and how that would compare in your trade. Uh, for the direct entry, we just uh, saw that we, we'd need about uh, one kilometer per second of delta V to do the, the propulsive capture, and that's, that's what we gained with the aero braking, and then the, the EDL is, is pretty much the same. So uh, we just did the calculations with the smaller, the, sorry, bigger uh, lander, but as the pretty much the same trajectory as the one that would use the aero braking. The only difference being um, how we slow down, but then the EDL is pretty much the same. Um, <clears throat> other than the cost of the rocket, how did you come up with the uh, cost of the development of the lander itself? 
Okay, so the development cost or the, the cost of the landers? Well, both together. Development cost we saw mostly on the scheduled costs of MSL and we try to scale them up a bit, but um, it's, we, we, we're not uh, creating the payload, we're just doing the lander. So we took uh, the cost estimates that were given by the, just making the lander on MSL, which is not that easy to find because they just put everything together. And we just try to scale that up a bit. And this is uh, pretty much approximate. For the landers, uh, we tried uh, crossing different things uh, on the HTV, for example, how much that would cost, uh, how much the um, s other capsules would have cost, and uh, again, trying to average that out and see how much it would cost about that. Thank you. Um, so for human missions, um, it's kind of a unique case where you'll have multiple landers going to the same landing site or same general vicinity. So um, detaching portions of the heat shield and jettisoning them uh, can result in some risk exposure that you might hit something on the surface, but there are plenty of ways to target those disposal maneuvers safely. But I was just curious, how um, are you separating away from the heat shield? So you've got a, a fairly lightweight heat shield and a heavy vehicle behind it. Or just propulsively uh, uh, just, yeah, flying just away? Just put burn so that uh, it just falls and we don't fall with it. Uh, you can see it on when, when we did all the pictures. Uh, we just do a very quick burn so that there's a difference of speed. And But yeah, we, we didn't really look into trying to not hit what's underneath, <laughs> to be totally honest. No problem. Um, so the three reasons why this type of trajectory that you, uh, that you assumed are typically not done are Long duration, which isn't a problem here. Um, difficulty of precision landing, which is not a problem here, and thermal soak. This type of entry with a very shallow approach and an extended run-up um, tends to thermally overload the vehicle, even if you have a very low peak heating. Um, so have you conducted an analysis that your IAD, which is not a very big thermal mass, um, is going to be able to sustain the extended thermal soak of this extended aero breaking and very shallow uh, EDL process before being jettisoned? Uh, for that, it's mostly the studies that we have read on the tests that have been done. And so we, we didn't do the, the, um, the calculations about that. We just referred to the literature and what we found in the studies of uh, IADs that are currently under development and uh, even them are not exactly sure on what materials to use for example that's not that's why we didn't go into details about how uh, to make that one uh, but from what they're saying it, it should be they, they uh, most of the studies are actually trying to land 40 tons uh, so that's much bigger uh, loads those studies typically assume direct entry where thermal soak is not quite as much of a problem oh, um, yeah. okay thank you uh, for your 10-ton lander, roughly, what, what was the entry mass when, when you enter the atmosphere uh, to land the 10-ton payload? Um, I don't recall. I think it was, we have it written somewhere, 18.5. Uh, no, I, no, I don't know if you can see it. Okay, so 18.5-ton so entry mass to land the 10-ton the, uh, payload. Yeah, and then uh, so then then what was what is your launch mass for the ten ton uh, lander when, when you uh, launch it? Forty tons, which oh, for is the max capacity of the SLS Block Two. Oh, okay. So 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 you're launching forty tons towards Mars, and but the 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 mass of what's entering is eighteen point five tons. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any further questions? It's a little bit. If you have any no, questions. No, that, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next team is the, uh, the, the, the Um, good afternoon, everybody. We are Team Argonova. 
We are a team composed of 10 students uh, from all different backgrounds and all over the world. And we are currently studying a master in space science and technology at the University um, of Luleå in Sweden. So here with us today, there's Gabriel, Felix, Samuel, Flo, and myself, Antonella. So today we're going to go through the mission design, the spacecraft design, the project management, and we're going to do a brief conclusion about our spacecraft, Argonova, starting with the mission design. So we were given some requirements. First of all, we had to be able to land a 10 metric ton payload on the surface of Mars. It had to be safe for humans. That, meaning, that means we are going to be within the 5G limit. Additionally, it had to be cost effective and it had to be ready to launch by 2026. We faced some, some challenges. First of all, the payload given to us was 10 times heavier than anything ever landed so far on the surface of Mars. It, we have a time critical descent given that the entry descent and landing phase only lasts a couple of minutes, meaning every phase has to be very accurate. The Martian atmosphere is thin, meaning that we don't have a very drug force on a spacecraft to slow it down, but it's also thick enough to create heat and thermal, uh, thermal stresses over our um, spacecraft. And we have unpredictable landing windows, meaning that when we get to a parking orbit, we don't know if we're going to find dust storms or what kind of weather we're going to find to actually safely land our spacecraft on the landing site given. So the mission the mission phases. Our first one is our, our orbital phase. So as an initial assumption, we are given that our spacecraft is in a hyperbolic trajectory of three kilometers per second at the Mars sphere of influence. The orbital fa phase includes a Mars capture, and, um, and af afterwards, after we capture Mars, we have to lower our orbit to reach a low circular orbit in which we're going to park our spacecraft, do some system check. If we have a crew, actually, we can also do a health check on them and also find the best landing window. Afterwards, we're going to detach, flip, and stabilize. In this phase, we're going to detach the propulsive system using for the capture stage. We're going to flip, if needed, in, in order for the heat shield to actually point in the right direction, and we're going to stabilize the spacecraft. Afterwards, we're going to have the heat shield deployment, the entry in the atmosphere, we're going to also descend through the atmosphere, of course. Afterwards, we're going to de detach the heat shield to start a supersonic retropropulsion deceleration to actually, hopefully, successfully land on the surface of Mars if everything goes to plan. But where do we land? For the landing site choice, we went through a 2020 Mars landing workshop evaluation that was carried out. And um, it, the selection was based on sign criteria. What was actually uh, considered for us the most important one was if any of the landing sites could have a possible um, scientific discoveries and also since we always had in mind to possibly have humans landing on Mars if any of the landing sites could actually have some water resources. That's we decided the two best optimal landing sites so far was first one the Jazeera crater and the other one was the Annie Sirtis. Both of them are actually very close to each other being at a latitude of about 18 degrees and they have an altitude of roughly pi, uh, minus two kilometers. But how do we get to the landing site? For the trajectory we actually through, went through an aero braking and a propulsive capture analysis. For the aero braking the target orbit is solely reached by the mainly reached by the atmospheric drag meaning a spacecraft is actually going to be lighter meaning cheaper. The problem is that it's, the length is too high for an aero braking maneuver to, if we're considering humans on board. But on the other side, for a propulsive capture, yes, it is too fast, it is very fast, but the delta V required is solely uh, provided by the propulsion system, meaning a spacecraft is actually going to be heavier and more expensive. For the first one, for the aero braking, we first are going to insert ourselves into high elliptical aerocentric orbit. We decided to have an inclination on 90 degrees for the aero braking case because we want to take advantage of a higher density of Martian atmosphere at the poles. Afterwards, we use a NASA general mission analysis tool to actually simulate the orbit that we're going to, that we would perform, and this is what it would look like. After the, aero, the um, we get into highly elliptical orbit, we actually start the aero braking phase in which we want to lower the orbit to around 110 kilometers and then start the DL phase. For the aero braking phase, we, are, we wrote a MATLAB code 
in which we simulated the um, error breaking phase, calculating the delta V for every single orbit and um, to find the total time required and the total delta V. And we found out that delta V of error breaking will roughly be minus 1.24 kilometer per second and it would take us 220 days. For the propulsive capture, we decided of, we have to do a mass capture and it's completely done by the propulsive system. And we're gonna do an impulsive burn at the periapsis of the hyperbolic entry trajectory. And again, we want to lower uh, the Mars, the, um, we wanna lower the spacecraft orbit to have a circular orbit of around 110 kilometers. For this, we used, again, NASA to simulate our orbit, and we were able to find the delta V required and the inclination. The thrust is given by the um, characteristic of our propulsion system. The delta V required is roughly 2.27 kilometers per second. We chose the inclination to be lower than the 90 degrees because we want to, and to be 35 degrees, because we actually want to use the, we want to re use the Martian rotational speed to give us some help and reduce some uh, propulsion weight. And also, it had to be higher than our landing side um, latitude of 18 degrees. And this is what our simulation for the trajectory looks like for the propulsive capture. Afterwards, we carried out a trade-off between the arrow breaking and the propulsive capture trajectory. As you can see from the table, the arrow breaking would take us 228 days, but we would consume around 23 tons less of fuel. So it was always in our mind that we want to land humans on Mars. So what we deemed more important was the human factor, meaning we wanted a very fast entry. So we chose the propulsive capture. Because the arrow breaking would take 228 days. If you add the six months of interplanetary travel, we exceed heavily the um, limit for astronauts' exposure to radiation and weightless condition. The arrow breaking trajectory would be good if you were only sending, uh, if you had in mind only a cargo mission of 10 tons on Mars. And now, uh, Flo? Now I will talk a bit about the spacecraft design. So here we see an overall picture of the Argonova design. Our design consists of two main stages, um, an outer capture stage and then the central lander stage. We chose this because we want to reduce the actual mass landed on the surface. So the lander stage consists of the payload and everything required to bring this payload safely from a Martian orbit to the Martian surface. Additionally, we have a capture stage which serves only to go from interplanetary approach to the Martian orbit. And in between the two stages, we have an interstage release mechanism and attached to the lander stage is an HID, which will be dropped before landing. And we'll go into more detail on that just now. So this capture stage, this is what it looks like. It consists of four ASS-2 engines and 37 tons of total fuel, uh, nitrogen, tetroxide, and MMH. And this, these are the main components, and they're enclosed in a structural frame and then in a 20 millimeter shell all around. We didn't do a very detailed design on this capture stage as it's a basic rocket stage. We focused our efforts on the lander stage. So the lander stage is shown here um, in yellow. I think I have a pointer. This is the payload at the bottom. Um, below the payload, we have thrusters. You can see one here. There's a two rings of thrusters, which are for the final descent. And above the payload, we have a central platform. And above that, the fuel for these thrusters, for fuel tanks. And here we have landing legs in the deployed final position. Now, how do we get this? Oh, this is a, for scale, roughly what it would look like. This is about five meters from here to here. Um, how do we land this craft safely on Mars? Now, there's several deceleration technologies possible to lose the delta V of about three and a half kilometers from the Martian orbit to the surface. Traditionally, parachutes is the go-to thing. The problem on Mars, of course, is the atmosphere is so thin. If you have such a big payload, the parachutes become so big our analysis showed about 27 meters would be required, and this is problematic because um, it hasn't been achieved before and there's stability issues with such big parachutes and they become very heavy. If we try to use a single solid heat shield, it turns out this also becomes very, very large for such a big payload, and one of the problems is it won't fit in the launch vehicle. If we launch from Earth, if we have one solid heat shield, it won't fit. Um, or we could use pure supersonic retropropulsion all the way from orbit, um, here, the issue is with a 10-ton payload, you need a lot of fuel. And the more fuel you add, the heavier it becomes, the more fuel you need. The rocket equation is not kind in this regard. It would not be very cheap. 
So NASA is aware of all these problems and has been in research in the last decades what else we can use. And one interesting field, um, as we have seen before, is um, these inflatable aerodynamic decelerators. Um, particularly, we looked at a hypersonic inflatable decelerator, an HID, which consists of an inflatable structure um, covered in a thermal protection system. And this is basically a heat shield that you can blow up when you need it. Um, shown here is the, it's a, the RV3 um, HID that's been tested on Earth. There's been some test flights, RV3, RV4, but it hasn't been tested on Mars. However, the technology has been investigated for a long time and is quite feasible, we believe. Therefore, we chose to use an HID for deceleration. Now, we cannot use the HID all the way to the surface. We will have to still have propulsion for the last section, but we want to maximize the amount of delta V we lose from the drag of the shield. Therefore, we want to be in the atmosphere as long as possible. So to do this, we need to have lift. We don't want to come down straight. We want to come down at an angle and be a longer time in the atmosphere. And to get lift, we need to have a high L over D ratio, lift over drag, which we can achieve by modulating our angle of attack. Normally, we do this with the shape of the vehicle, but that means we have to change the design of our actual structure. Instead, we investigated the use of an asymmetric HID. So this means we shift um, the central axis of the HID to make one side longer, and the drag is asymmetric. And the more you shift it, different characteristics are achieved. Um, it modulates the angle of attack, which in turn lets us control by the amount of shift um, the L over D ratio that is desirable to maximize our time in atmosphere. And this is the benefit, as I said, of keeping the vehicle symmetric itself. Um, this has quite complicated effects on the aerodynamics. Um, on the left, we see the effects on angle of attack and L over D of the different shifts. And looking at this, we decided to go for um, a 40% shifted HRD. It also has effects on the stability of the craft, and the red line is the line of force through the center of gravity. So um, the optimum case for our lander turned out to be a 40% shifted HRD. We can see that the line of force is still quite in, in the middle, which is good, so it means the mounting will still be central and symmetric to the vehicle. Um, Finally, this is what our HID design then looks like. On the top left, we have the stowed version, um, the mounting, and then it's deployed, it will look like this once it's inflated with gas. And the base diameter is 15 meter and the nose cone is a, a nine meter diameter, which wouldn't fit in a launch vehicle. And now, um, after we will jettison this HID um, once when we get close to the surface and we'll then use the thrusters at the bottom for a final which is still supersonic, but a final propulsive landing. Now we will hear a bit more about the propellant for this landing. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, then for the propellant design, uh, for the propulsion design, we uh, first we had to decide which kind of fuel we use. And then between the three uh, types of uh, chemical thruster in the market, uh, we decided to be propellant because they give a... a a uh, really, uh, really good uh, thrust uh, with an easy uh, storage. So uh, for the second de de decision, we, we choose a, a fit type of uh, a pressure fit system with helium, with helium that uh, gives a, a, a constant profile uh, with different restarts, with su uh, subsequent restart and uh, a lower complexity. Uh, then, uh, between the, thr uh, the thruster, we decided that uh, each stage has different thruster. Uh, for that reason, for the capsule stage, uh, it's a, a, burn, a single burn that can uh, last several minutes, so the thrust is not so important, but we really want a high uh, uh, in in specific input because we want to lower the, the mass of the fuel. Uh, the mass and the, of the thruster is not so important because it can be neglected uh, to the mass of the total uh, of the mass of the stage. Then, uh, as a final decision, we decided the AS22 uh, thruster that uh, has been already proved uh, tested with the Ariane 5 program and it gives, it gives a really high uh, specific input of 340, 340 seconds. Then, for the lander stage, uh, the situation is completely opposite. Uh, we want to get uh, reduce the velocity of 345 meters per second in a very short time uh, period of time. For that reason, we need a really high thrust of the of the rockets, and we also want to minimize the mass and the size to reduce the mass of the total uh, of the stage. 
Then, as a, uh, as a final decision, we, de uh, we decided the SpaceX Super Draco because uh, it gives a really high thrust with really small size. Uh, it also allows to make a smooth landing. And then, uh, the last set of uh, thrusters that we use is the RCS. And for them, the main concern uh, we, we took into mind it, it was to save the same propellant and fit system as the lander thruster, so we don't have to increase the uh, weight or the complexity of the lander stage. Then uh, the, uh, the decision was the SpaceX Draco, that uh, it's used the same uh, propellants and the same fit system, only changing the parts. And it also uh, has a really good uh, thrust to uh, versus size ratio. Uh, then uh, uh, several simulations were, uh, were run and to decide how many thrusters we need for this uh, stage. For the capture stage, we, are, we only need four thrusters uh, that we, uh, we uh, use a square configuration. Then for the primary, uh, primary uh, thrusters that are the ones that uh, use in the landing, we use two concentric grids of eight and five thrusters. Uh, uh, regarding issues of uh, stability and plume, uh, plume in, uh, and, the, and the interaction between plumes that we will talk about later. And uh, to finish, uh, the RCS control, we decided to use uh, 12, uh, 12 thrusters uh, with four uh, symmetrical thru thrusters in each side, as we can see in the, in the bottom and in the two, two sides. Okay, and to finish, I want to make a breakdown of the uh, fuel uh, fuel uh, that we can see that uh, the main part of the fuel uh, is in the capture uh, stage, uh, that we need uh, 36.75 tons of fuel that with a margin of 2,000 kilograms. Uh, this margin is very thin, because, very tight because uh, the, the maneuver is really straightforward and, we, and the uh, rockets have been tested. And then for the uh, lander stage, uh, we need to uh, the the fuel has to be necessary uh, enough uh, to uh, to perform all the maneuvers like uh, leaving the parking orbit, orientation and control, and landing. Uh, in this uh, in the lander stage, the margin is high because we need uh, because uh, because of the mission uh, mission critical nature of the landing and entry point, uh, and also to cater with contingency scenarios. Uh, so we can see that uh, in total we need uh, 46 tons of fuel, roughly. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to let my colleague to talk about the structure. Thank you, Samu. I will continue about the mechanical system overview um, of the lander itself. So we have to land the payload somehow. It's 10 tons, that's what we know. Um, we decided to go with the disc as a shape, um, one diameter height, uh, one meter height, and a density of about one metric ton per cubic meter. Um, the structure is designed around the payload and of course also about the propulsive system. The lander structure, it's a blunt body entry profile, so we have more resistance to break, we have uh, to minimize the thermal loads and the th center of mass and center of pressure um, is almost the same, so we have more stability during descent. That's also because of the payload being relatively near to the bottom of the whole lander. We have a lightweight design. We used um, a frame with two decks. So deck one is here, deck two is here. And we'll talk about this in a second. And we use our main materials are aluminum and a titanium alloy, which are both space grade metals, so they are available and tested. Next, of course, we have to um, take a look at the most critical parts of the lander. So we have the central plate and we have the frame. For the central plate, we use a honeycomb um, center structure to be very stiff and um, also light. We did a simulation for natural frequency analysis. So we have the first and the second mode on the left, the first mode on the right, the second mode. Um, of those frequencies to analyze the actual stresses of the whole um, central plate. Um, for aluminum, we exceeded the displacement and stress by far, uh, so we can't use aluminum at all for this central plate. 
So we have to use uh, titanium. For titanium, the maximal displacement is only 0 0.136 millimeters at a frequency of about uh, 45 hertz, which is absolutely acceptable. Therefore, titanium is required. For the frame, um, we did simulation with the maximum load of 5 Gs, and we saw that the stresses um, limit the, the stress and displacement limits exceed the um, stresses of aluminium by far. So for the frame, we also have to use titanium. So um, we have the structural analysis, so let's continue with the thermal analysis. For thermal analysis, we know that the planetary and aerodynamical um, loads, heat loads, are much, much higher than the space environmental loads. Therefore, we simulate for the most extreme um, case in the final landing, where we just detached the HIAD from the lander itself. So we get the high supersonic um, airflow or atmosphere flow from Mars to the lander while we are still thrusting with our thrusters. Um, therefore, we have a radiation profile of 718 watts, we found out in our simulations, which equivalents to a temperature of 69 degrees Celsius maximum on the outer shell of our lander. Therefore, passive control is absolutely sufficient um, with 12 to 15 layers of Captain MLI, which is a pretty standard in space. So next I will talk about the challenges with the plumes. So what's a plume in this case? A plume is a hot stream of gas coming from the engine exhaust. So why is it important? Well, we don't want to land on an unstable environment. So we want to be safe and land safe. We could land on icy surface, which would melt, or the heat of the exhaust would melt the icy surface, so the icy surface would supplement. We could land on a sandy surface, which would create a crater, as you can see in the pictures, um, or would crystallize the sand itself, which would be unstable. Or we could land on a rocky surface, which could eventually um, create hazardous um, projectiles for the legs, for the lander itself. This ha all has to be considered, and therefore an optimal arrangement is needed for the thrusters and the landing gear. Coming to the thrusters, so we want to minimize the overlap of the inner plumes um, in our design to minimize the pressure that is overall in the plumes. Um, here in this picture, you can see the red dots are all the thrusters itself. So we have two, as it mentioned, was mentioned before, we have two rings of thrusters, one outer and one inner ring. Um, the blue and the green circles represent the diameter of the plume the maximum diameter actually in mass at Martian atmosphere. Um, with this, we have the optimal engine arrangement for our um, case. The maximum bloom radius or actually diameter is um, uh, 5.36 meters, so the legs have to be outside of this radius. And the legs are designed accordingly. So speaking of the legs, we have four actuated spider legs um, of course with dampers, um, arranged in a 90 degree angle and at a diameter of 6.5 meters. So we have even more um, buffer to the actual plume to be safe. Next I want to speak about the AOCS and communications. So for AOCS we have a low pointing accuracy requirement. So we can use star trackers, sun sensors, IMU and the RCS thrusters with their redundancy. Of course, IMU, because it's critical, um, because of the timing, it has hot redundancy. Um, for communications, because it's pretty standard what we can use for this mission, because it's quite near, um, we designed from Heritage. For the capture stage, we have a direct link to Earth. For the lander, we had an UHF relay to the satellite, which will then relay it to Earth. For the power systems, since we have a very short mission of uh, 336 hours, um, we are starting from the Mars capture, we can, use, we can use only batteries for this stage. And our main batteries in total will have 52 kilowatts per... Everything shut down. All right, so um, speaking of batteries, we have a 
battery capacity, a total battery capacity of lander and capture stage of 52 kilowatts per uh, kilowatt hours and a mass of 104 kilogram. But the batteries are mainly into in the capture stage, so we can actually we don't have to land it. So, as you can see, we only have 0 0.6 kilograms on our lander itself, since have very low requirements for um, the whole battery. Next, we have our design. We land on um, Mars, but we now want to know if it's actually correct. So Gabriel will continue with simulations and the proof that it's actually possible. Right. <coughs> Thank you. So um, to simulate the whole uh, descent, we used MATLAB and used 2D equations of motion. And the first thing we had to ask ourselves, okay, the, the atmosphere is a critical component, so um, we looked at different models from, the, from NASA and we picked three models in the end, which is uh, a simple ba uh, basic model, one that's simply a fit from data from an actual flown mission and a scale height model. And there we said, okay, density as the most critical component, we want to be conservative in the assumption first, so we took the model with the lowest density in the higher altitudes, which is model two in that case. Why is the lower altitudes not, not that important? Because there we will be thrusting, so the thrust will be um, the defining design trait. In any case, we also did a quick analysis with the th different models and showed that with all three it's still possible and really the most conservative is possible. And then we also had to characterize the HIAD as seen before in the slide, rather uh, complicated. This is just for the 40% shifted. These are the characteristics we could use. And we wanted to use a L over D of about 0.275 according to a study that we found. So this is where we ended up with. And this is also in accordance with the minus 20 degrees angle of attack that we get from the shifted HID design. We also were concerned how stable is the HID? How long can we use that? And we found a study that shows that um, the aerodynamics coefficient down until um, Mach of about, let's say, 1.5, 1.4. So around here, you can definitely use. So we used Mach 1.7. So we use our HID until Mach 1.7 to have a bit of margin to Mach 1.5. Um, then we can look at the descent trajectory. And the standard graph that's always shown is altitude versus velocity. Um, as you can see, this is comparable to current characteristics due to the HID and also the two-dimensional trajectory. What strikes in the first place is we can see that there's the, the region where most speed is decelerated. We could move that into the atmosphere uh, aerodynamic deceleration. So we did achieve what we wanted to with the HID. And it's still a rather small portion of the actual trajectory, interestingly. Um, then we also see the start of the thrusting phase, which is at around 345 meters per second, which we need to decelerate only by thrusting. In the trajectory itself, this is seen here. We don't see any like harsh knicks, harsh uh, dents in there. It's really just uh, nearly vertically going down to the ground. In total, we move about 700 kilometers above ground, as can be seen here in the graph. Um, and then we also looked at the aerothermodynamic loads. First, we looked at the, the pressure loads, actually, which gave us the, the G loads. We had a hard limit of 5 Gs, but we ended up actually at minus 3.5 Gs as a maximum load, which is uh, favorable considering especially human exploration again, which was always the case for our study. Then we also have the thrusting phase, which can be easily seen here. It's also just half a G, as we assumed currently, worst case again, rather continuous thrusting instead of just a suicide burn um, to lower the effect on human bodies. Then we also looked um, at the heat flux, which we used the Sutton Graves model for. And we see that a maximum heat flow of 35 kilowatts per square meter is there, which the HI can, D can easily take. Um, because it's actually normally designed for direct entry and our heat loads will be lower due to um, the, the low mass orbit we enter before. Um, and then I want to briefly talk about project management. So we first uh, looked at the schedule. As we can see, the Draco is already available. The driving factors are actually the HID, which has to be developed, and the landing legs because it's a mechanism that has to be developed. The other custom parts are also rather late in the, in the design 
because they have to be developed too, but are not that critical. All other components that are not shown are assumed to be commercial off-the-shelf components, so it is not that critical. As we can see, the lander stage should be assembled by 2024, so we should have a two-year margin actually to our launch date of 2026. Then we did a risk analysis. We could identify 11 sources of failure, and then we narrowed it down to three major sources of failure, which are the HID, the landing, and the software. And HID and landing is simply because this has never been done before in that manner, so there is a huge risk attached to it because there is no um, experience. Therefore, heavy testing is required on Earth, which drives the cost, as you see later. And software is also a point, um, as we looked at other missions and have seen that software often has caused issues, at least. Um, then we looked at the cost. As you can see, power communications and control, as we have rather standard things, we have extremely cheap uh, subsystems in that respect. The main cost drivers will be the structure, thermal and mission operations. Structure and thermal, mostly, as I said, it's, uh, it's special design and we have to develop it newly. Mission operations is assumed to be as high because for the first time when we want to launch, so this is mostly for the initial launch, um, for the first mission, it's critical to have a lot of manpower on ground as for a human Mars mission. So in total we add up at 2.6 billion dollars. Then we have a mass budget, there we want to focus on the most important things which are the capture stage with a dry mass of 12 tons and the lander structure with a dry mass of 16 tons. We always assumed according to ESA standards 20% margin so far because they are um, newly, developed, um, newly developed subsystems. All the other subsystems don't add too much to the mass budget. So we end up at a total dry mass of the lander of 30, 34 tons, um, of the total vehicle of 34 tons. And when adding the propellant, we end up at 81 tons in Martian orbit and 10 tons on ground in the end. So in conclusion, um, we have a vehicle that's going propulsively and be captured into the Martian orbit. It's consisting of two spacecraft, a cap parts at capture stage and the lander stage. Um, this allows us a highly flexible architecture, in fact, as we focused so far on human exploration, but if we want to do a cargo mission, we could easily exchange the, the propellant heavy capture stage to a more uh, lightweight aero braking stage or aero capture stage even. Also, we you will use a shifted HID as we have a natural stability considering having our LOD of 0.275 and um, flying through, through the atmosphere. Um, we will be using supersonic retropropulsion mostly for the human factor again as we want to have precision landing. And again, as I said already, human exploration was our focus. Um, the design also can be used though for cargo missions. Thank you very much for your attention and we're glad to answer any questions. 32 minutes. We have uh, eight minutes for questions. You mentioned a payload density of one ton per cubic meter. Wondering if you had done anything in terms of comparing uh, to, to other payloads and you know trying to anchor that figure. Um, yes, we were considering thinking about humans versus cargo. Cargo would usually be a much higher density if we're landing machines or it could be higher than that. Um, but for example, the Apollo command modules we looked at have about 300 kilograms um, per cubic meter. And because our focus is human, we took kind of an average in between those. Um, so one ton is about water fuel. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not difficult to take something even more dense because we have the space. If we have a lower density, we would have to change the design. Um, very extensive analysis covered a lot of ground. Um, can you explain uh, why you use two different reference orbits in GMAT when you were trading off direct versus uh, versus aero capture? Um, so we use GMAT to do um, the uh, to do the trajectory analysis because thanks to GMAT we could actually have the delta v's and also we can 
we run a lot of simulation to actually find which would give us the bell data V. We also were aiming to have a fly path angle entry of about five degrees. So with GMAT, we could actually do that. In, it gives a, it's a little bit limited when regarding to the atmosphere, but since I was, I, we just wanted to put it in a parking RB for now, it actually gives a pretty sensitive trajectory analysis for a preliminary analysis that we'd, like we did. But there were two different orbits. You had one for a direct capture and one for an arrow break. Can you explain why you used two different reference orbits? Oh. Uh, do you know, sorry? That we've used two different reference orbits. No, uh, excuse me. You mean, f no, the reference orbits are both high. Yeah, for your, for your arrow breaking case, you had a high inclination, high uh, approach, and for your, direct ed for your direct descent, you came in oh, more yeah, equatorial. We, um, for the arrow breaking, we had a high inclination because we wanted to um, pass through the poles, because we, we wanted the periapsis to actually pass through the poles, the south pole in that case, because we wanted to have a um, higher drag. Why for the um, arrow capture one, we had a lower inclination because we wanted to also use the rotation on Mars, speed of Mars, and yeah. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So if I understand your, your mass list uh, correctly, and, and that was a great mass list, um, the, the amount of mass that you're launching to Mars is 81 tons, is that correct? Yes, that includes both vehicles. Okay. So, uh, uh, so how, how do you launch that much mass? Is it two separate launches? Um, yeah, that is, we, we did ask about the constraints in the, in the competition, and we were told that we only need to consider starting from the sphere of influence of Mars. Right, right. So we did not, like this was out of the scope of our uh, analysis. Okay. We All are right. aware of the high mass. To, Right, it, it, but, but, but the amount of useful payload mass you're landing on Mars is, is 10 tons. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your schedule? Uh, you know, how long each phase is gonna take? Um, I hope I can talk a little bit more about it. Sadly, the expert who did it is not here today. Um, so the, the idea was to first find the most driving factors, the most driving constraints, which is, as I already mentioned, the HID and the custom parts. We did not include, so all, all that is mentioned up here is technologies or are technologies that are, um, either in development or have been uh, developed to some extent already or tested. Not necessarily exactly in the co configuration we would want them, but um, at least let's say TRL6, TR, um, around that TRL, yeah, TRL6 should be about right. Um, as we did, as there have been tests. Again, for example, landing legs is a concept that is not has not been used so far, but we can test it on ground and this can be developed. HIAD is, it has been tested at NASA, but obviously not attached to our spacecraft, so that would be testing, but in principle it has been there too. Still, it's completely new, it has never been done before, so testing is a heavy, heavy driver. Exactly, our, our HIAD will be a bit bigger than what has been tested so far. Um, for components like electronics, like communication, um, like power, we we do not require very special components in that respect, so we did not assume that they will be driving the design. Um, and therefore, we came to, the, to, to this schedule. Was that enough? Or? All right. Yeah, one more question. Um, you had the payload pretty low in the vehicle, and I think uh, you mentioned that this was to help lower the CG as you're burning off propellant towards the end. I was just curious, did you guys spend any time thinking about how you would deploy the payload if it was something that needed to be taken off the vehicle? Yes, um, in our mechanical design, we have an access bay to the payload. It's not easy to see, but there's kind of a door. Um, but we envisioned this being part of a bigger program to land on Mars with many vehicles, many landers. And we assumed that you would possibly have a truck or something able to come there, open the door, and take the payload out. Um, we don't, so in the end, the payload will be above the surface. It will not be on the surface, it's still on the legs. Um, yeah, so it would need, 
at some point off there's on the human focus the people can walk down the ladder basically um, um question um you rejected arrow breaking because of the long amount of time to execute the capture. Why did you uh, reject uh, direct entry? Uh, okay, our main concern to reject direct entry because we are carrying humans and we don't know how is the atmosphere. I mean, we don't have a really good simulation of the atmosphere and if we go directly through into the atmosphere and suddenly there is a storm, we don't know what can happen. So we wanted to stop in a parking orbit so we can just like see what is happening from there and then decide, okay, this is a safe window to park, to land, and then we arrive to the place we want. Thank you. I believe that's their time. All right, thank Sorry, you very much. May what? I add quickly, there yes. was also the consideration we can do final systems check, especially in a human exploration mission, we can also check crew health status again after spending the time in interplanetary flight and if necessary we do not need to go down on the surface we we would we would have simply time to consider okay does the crew is the crew able to withstand it would it need some let's say training additionally to build up some muscle mass again not favorable all of it but we simply wanted to have kind of a security layer in the in the architecture of the mission with the intermediate stage of the of the parking orbit right thank you very much uh, the next team is uh, Gurjao from India and Italy. Good afternoon. My name is Chris, and I am here representing Team Gurjao. And I'd like to present our design for the Red Eagle Mars Lander Design Competition. Uh, the thing that struck us when we read the competition briefing was the statement, the requirement is to design a 10 metric ton payload capacity Mars lander that can be designed, built, and launched no later than 2026 as cheaply, safely, and simply as possible. Now, cheaply, safely, simply. Um, so basically, we aim to use heritage technologies, uh, we have especially taken inspiration from the Apollo missions. We have also considered other um, uh, research technologies, uh, such as the morphing ring technology that you can see in the lower left of the slide, and also reusable mass ferries that you see on the lower right. Unfortunately, these technologies are not at a sufficiently high TRL, technological readiness level, so we decided not to opt for those. Uh, so what did we opt for? Well, more on that later. Okay, uh, first we decided to uh, select the entry trajectory. Uh, since uh, we have been given a deadline of 2026, uh, and Mars has a synodic period of uh, 2.1 years, so every other year there's no solution for the launch deadline given by the competition. Uh, practically every NASA mission to Mars uses a direct transfer, so our mission will also follow the same trajectory. However, we have a problem. Mars has a regular dust storm season, and um, in this table you can see the predictions of the future dust storm season start dates and end dates, these dates are based on historical data. They also include sufficient margin. The global dust storm season on Mars, it usually takes place uh, from the northern hemisphere spring equinox on Mars from 180 degrees to 340 degrees. Now, typically, we don't want to land any kind of human crew on Mars during the dust storm because Martian dust is bad for health. In addition, we cannot take high-resolution pictures of the surface when a dust storm is covering Mars. So our mission has to avoid these seasons completely. This we can do by following one of two options. We can enter the Mars orbit and wait there until the storm is over, or we can use an interplanetary trajectory that arrives after the so dust storm season ends. Now, 
Often the Mars landers enter the Martian atmosphere immediately without going into the orbit first. So often the second approach is followed. So we see that the 2026 transfer in the previous slide, it has its, um, yeah. It has its arrival date just before the dust storm season. So the arrival date is 3rd September, and the dust storm season starts on 18 October 2027, same year. So we'll have to arrive after the dust storm season ends, that's 5th July 2028. So we are going to accomplish this by doing one full orbit around the sun before we arrive at Mars. So our launch date is now 5th July, 2026. So yes, our transfer time takes a full two years. We, a, we, have, um, we have chosen aero capture for inserting our lander into the orbit around Mars. Um, after the aero capture, propulsive maneuvers will insert our lander into an acceptable parking orbit, and then we deorbit the vehicle when it's ready to descend. After aero capture, we do a delta V at the apoapsis to raise the periapsis, and we establish an elliptical parking orbit, and the lander will remain here until it's ready to descend. And additionally, uh, we can put other orbiting assets like a vehicle to take back a human crew back to Earth from Mars. Uh, from this orbit, another propulsive delta V is used to deorbit the craft such that it will meet our three kilometer per second entry velocity. And we will have a peak deceleration of 5G. The reason we have chosen a 5 Earth G constraint is because it's the maximum deceleration that a human crew can tolerate for a short duration. After the lifting entry, the capsule will continue to decelerate until our propulsive uh, descent phase begins. And it will continue till the re our lander safely touches down on the Martian surface. Uh, this slide gives us a good look at the EDL entry, uh, descent, landing uh, trajectory of our lander. Okay, now we move on to the flight systems. As I said, we have chosen heritage technology, so we have decided to go in for an expendable type of lander um, with an Apollo type of blunt body. Now, how did we size this? Well, um, as for the competition briefing, we are supposed to be able to carry a maximum of 30 Mars exploration rovers, MERs. So, from the internet, I found out that MER dimensions are basically 1.5 meter height by 2.3 meter width and 1.6 meter length. So we arranged the rovers in a 5 by 6 array. And we have seen that they can fit into a 15 meter diameter vehicle. Um, but you have to keep in mind that um, this capsule is larger than any that has ever been used. In addition, um, we have selected L by D ratio of 0.3 because um, although we could go for a larger value, then uh, we'll um, have a decrease in drag rather than an increase in lift. And uh, this can pose a serious problem on Mars where the atmospheric density is low and it is difficult to decelerate the vehicle to proper velocity before it hits the surface or exits the atmosphere. So we have stuck to the maximum limit of L by D is equal to 0.3 and so our vehicle height L is just 4.5 meters. 
Okay, and uh, from various research that has already been done, we can see that for an L by D, that's 0.3, and a diameter of 15 meters, and a payload mass of 10 metric tons, um, it will correspond to a little more than a 50 metric tons of initial mass. And, but given the high degree of uncertainty in how our subsystem masses may change as uh, our design develops and matures, so we put a little bit of a mass contingency and we assume that our actual mass of the lander, including our payload, will be 60 metric tons. And as you can see on the slide, uh, we have also obtained uh, the mass breakdown for our lander and it's various subsystems. Now let us move on to the various uh, subsystems of our lander. Uh, we'll start with the thermal protection system. Uh, we have decided to go in for phenolic impregnated carbon ablator, PCAR for short. Now due to manufacturing constraints, uh, we can have only a maximum thickness of one uh, millimeter. And so we have put one millimeter thick uh, panels over fiber form. Again, due to manufacturing constraints, we can't uh, uh, manufacture our heat shield as a single piece. It has to be in a form of tiled panels. And you can see the configuration as on the slide. Um, the back shell of our vehicle is integral. It's not discarded. Instead, it's made up, as its sides are basically in the form of three petals, in the form of a tetrahedron. And um, we'll also be using small uh, ramplets, uh, which are basically little ramps made of a vector and cloth, uh, which are also connected to these three petals. And they'll fan out and create driving surfaces for the rovers to exit the lander when it arrives on the Martian surface. <coughs> and now we uh, move on to the propulsion system and it uh, has created a significant number of interesting challenges. Um, we have decided to go in for a four engine configuration as you can see on the slide because it creates the largest amount of useful area for both the payload and the propellant tanks. We have also decided to go in for existing technologies, namely uh, liquid bi-propellant engines using methane and liquid oxygen. There's also a huge advantage to using this um, system uh, for Mars missions because um, Carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere can be converted easily to methane using a chemical reaction called the Sabatier reaction. And the methane produced at Mars through this process can be used as a propellant for the Mars ascent vehicle or other devices like um, liquid oxygen, CH4 fuel cells. In addition, we have decided to uh, use uh, propellant tanks of titanium for due to the high uh, strength weight ratio. Okay, we, as you have seen earlier, we use a parachute system for deceleration. Uh, we go in for an existing technology once again, this gap band parachute of diameter 30 meters. Um, the reason we have limited it to 30 meters is because there are concerns regarding uh, material strength, stability, and fabrication. The parachute will also be deployed by mortar at Mark II. Again, we can't go beyond this because otherwise it will get subjected to air heating and also oscillation problems. For the orbital thruster and reaction control systems, we have gone in for the same configuration that was used by Apollo, a 12 thruster configuration. Um, we also use a hypergolic system using monomethyl hydrogen MMH and N204, again because of its simplicity and reliability. Uh, 
Moving on to the C3 system, command, control, and communications. Uh, we envision that our lander will have two amplifiers, two transponders, one primary high-gain antenna, two smaller low-gain antennas. Again, during the descent, we will be relying on radar, as you have seen during the EDL sequence, the Doppler radar, and also vision-based navigation in the form of cameras. Uh, this way, uh, we can uh, not only navigate our descent, we can also avoid hazards on the surface. Um, for direct-to-earth communication, we'll be making use of X-band antennas and uh, UHF antennas uh, in case there are local orbiters for transmitting uh, engineering data during the EDL sequence. <coughs> uh, please note that in case of human crew, we may require a higher data rate. In addition to what we are already using, um, for the now we move on to the power system. Uh, here we are. We have decided to make use of fuel cells using uh, LOX and sorry, liquid oxygen and methane. They will provide power after separation. But uh, prior to entry, we will be making use of uh, lithium-ion batteries for the EDL. In case of the landing technology, um, since we are using uh, we, this lander may carry human crew and other sensitive equipment, uh, we have chosen landing gear instead of airbags or crushable material. Uh, so far, the landers that have been employed by uh, NASA have predominantly used airbags, but that won't be suitable for a human crew. Um, in the case of our lander, we keep our landing gear in a folded condition within the heat shield until the power descent and landing phase during our EDL sequence. Okay, now we move on to the concept of operations. Our lander can be used both, uh, for, um, as a carrier for multiple rovers. We can use it as accommodation for human crew, as a delivery system for a Mars Ascent vehicle. Now, uh, for, uh, as a rover lander, well, I've already mentioned, we have a five by six array of rovers. Each um, rover is held in place by bolts and special nuts. These are released after landing with small explosives. Uh, <coughs> basically, uh, the, the deployment sequence is the same as what is currently uh, followed by MERs of NASA. As a final step, the MERs will drive off the lander deck and onto the surface of Mars. Keep in mind that at the end of, uh, at this point, uh, the lander is basically a lifeless shell. It has served its purpose in protecting and delivering the rovers. For as a human crew accommodation, um, well, you, in the slide you can see how our lander has been adapted for a, ma a manned mission to Mars. Uh, due to its sloped sidewalls, um, there's going to be a payload volume restriction. In fact, um, for our 15 meter diameter capsule, uh, the usable flow area works out to be only roughly 23 square meters. That's sufficient uh, only for a crew of uh, two people. So very limited floor space. Um, um, some four years ago, I believe, there was uh, an um, a mission competition titled Inspiration Mars held by the Mars Society, and this can be used for such a mission. In addition, it can also be used to land a larger inflatable hab separately. Now finally, it can also be used as a Mars Ascent Vehicle. A Mars Ascent Vehicle is a fully fueled single stage vehicle that can deliver the human crew from the Martian surface to a circular low Martian orbit and the pre-deployed booster stage will lift the MAV and its crews to a high Martian orbit, and thus the crew can be sent on a vehicle to take them back home to Earth. Uh, 
now uh, we move on to the schedule estimation. Uh, we have been, as mentioned earlier, we have selected a fixed launch date of 5th July 2026. And so we have to set a defined schedule. Uh, now keep in mind, since our lander is adaptable for human use, uh, the tasks with the longest duration are the ones concerned with the detailed design and as well as the testing of both the hardware as well as the final assembly. Okay, now the next slide, well, it was a bit difficult. Um, so uh, we have obtained our information on cost estimation from online sources. Uh, we have obtained it entirely in uh, US dollars. Um, NASA estimated that uh, the launch vehicle transportation would be approximately $100 billion. SpaceX said $36 billion. The Mars Society also estimated around $30 billion. We decided to be a little more optimistic and go with SpaceX. And uh, so the launch vehicle transportation works out to be $36 billion. And the Mars lander is $150 million, according to SpaceX. Uh, we are assuming there's only one end-to-end -end service provider, namely SpaceX. And, okay, um, now assuming that it's a, some kind of public-private partnership, and so uh, tax breaks, government subsidies, etc., are involved, so the cost may be borne entirely by the taxpayers. Keep in mind, this is just for the launch vehicle transportation and the Mars landers, not for the rovers. So uh, the US taxpayer population was approximately 138.3 million individuals. So the average cost per individual American taxpayer worked out to be less than $300. But you have to admit that this amount isn't that expensive because a single Mars mission gets spread out over many years. So in conclusion, we have designed a lander that's of 15 meter diameter and weighs 60 tons to carry our payload of 10 metric tons. So this meets our competition requirements, especially since it can, be, can meet a launch date by the end of 2026. In future, maybe landers with other shapes can be investigated because they may provide better packaging for larger payloads. Over the longer term, concepts like fully reusable landers and morphing wing technologies can be developed and implemented in order to improve the long-term sustainability of Mars exploration by eliminating waste because you have to keep in mind that at the end of each mission, the Mars lander is basically junk left on the Martian surface. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, uh, so I had actually a couple of questions. Uh, one is, yeah, you seem to have done a pretty extensive uh, uh, review and synthesis of uh, existing literature in the course of developing this. I was wondering if there are particular references or, or other aspects that you would see as being uh, most relevant to the work that you've done here. Uh, references? Um, okay. Uh, uh, I found a lot of research papers online, uh, especially the collaborative research that was done by the Georgia Institute of Technology with NASA. Yeah, the, those are especially relevant to the design. Okay, and then uh, the other question I had was, uh, you decided to use aero capture uh, and yet also use the two-year uh, transfer trajectory uh, to Mars. And I was wondering, uh, in terms of some of the issues related to dust, dust storms, what your thoughts are on how uh, going into orbit first might mitigate concerns there. Um, uh, the reason uh, we have uh, done a, a, our transfer takes a longer time is we are just trying to avoid the dust storm season, that's all.
because in case of a human crew, uh, Martian dust will be hazardous to their health. And in case of uh, rovers, uh, they won't get good pictures out of it. So when you were doing your assessment of uh, EDL performance, I noticed you had curves for using a parachute and for not using a parachute. And, and so you ended up deciding to pick a 30 meter diameter parachute that you're going to deploy at Mach 2. Did, did you really get much of a benefit from using the parachute versus not using the parachute? Uh, yeah, there is a slight benefit if you see the graph. The, yeah, you can uh, get us. Yeah, there's a slight advantage to it. So, 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 so if the advantage is really slight, I mean, did, did you think it was still worth, you thought it was still worth carrying the parachute? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, even with the mass and complexity of the parachute. And then to deploy the parachute, you know, I, I see you are trying to follow some parameters that we currently have used parachutes in. So you are deploying it at Mach 2. How are you going to get your vehicle down to Mach 2 to be able to deploy the parachute? Were, 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 were you thinking that was just going to happen aerodynamically using the heat shield? Um, yeah, and possibly using the uh, reaction thrusters. Okay. Maybe. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Um, what was the source of the numbers in your flight system's mass budget? Uh, the source is uh, this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, this, uh, it's a paper by Georgia Tech. Please remember to cite or give credit to your sources unless okay, you're generating uh, they numbers are yourself. Cited and credited in the project report I've submitted as part of the competition. Can you remind me what your total mass was again for the lander? Uh, the total mass, including the payload, is 60 metric tons, six zero. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, since you're capturing into Mars orbit and before you land, um, which would allow you to wait out a dust storm. Why did you decide to do a, a full orbit around the sun before you go to Mars uh, over concern of such thing? That seems like uh, that precaution is, is greater than the waiting time you would be in Mars orbit to have a dust storm go away. Okay, uh, the usual procedure is the Mars lander enters the Martian orbit immediately. Uh, uh, sorry, it enters the Martian atmosphere immediately without entering the Mars orbit first. So um, I chose to instead use a trajectory that uh, arrives after the storm. All right, are there any further questions? No. Okay. So I, I'd like to take a, a five-minute break, and we'll restart at 3 o'clock with uh, the uh, American team. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Jeremiah Kim. Uh, my name is Gene Lovano. Good afternoon. My name is Josephine. Hello, my name is Donnie. Hi, my name is Javin. My name is Diego. And this team is called Icarus from Cerritos High School and uh, Cal State University of Long Beach. And this is our 2018 Ready Gold International Design Competition proposal. To restate our mission objective, uh, it is to design a lander or land a lander of carrying a 10 metric ton payload with the crew to safely land on the surface of Mars by the year 2026. And by doing this, we want to provide crucial information for exploration and development, as well as to uh, recapture the interest of the public for space exploration and research. So for our presentation, we want to break this into two segments. The first segment talking about our lander, so what is made of its mass, is a schedule to build. And the second half of the presentation is the mission itself. So how are we going to enter? How are we land? 
Um, so for our lander, we break it down into three systems. Our primary system, our subsystem, and our protection systems. Our primary systems consist of the lander, its fuel, the engines, and the payload. Subsystems consist of power, the navigation computer, communications, and the RCS system. And then protection consists of heating, micrometeorite, and radiation protection. And so in the primary system, our lander, the Icarus, uh, stands 85 feet tall, or 25.9 meters tall, with a 9 meter diameter, and has a payload volume of 413 cubic meters. And now we will talk about the engines that we considered to our Icarus. So we'll start off with the Vicus 4B engine. That is a hypergolic engine. Then there's the RL-10B2, which is manufactured by Aerojet Rocketdyne. And then finally, SpaceX's Merlin 1D, and currently in development, the Raptor engines that are planned to be used by SpaceX's BFR rocket. So for Vicus 4B, its fuel is UH-25 with the oxidizer of N204, and it has a specific impulse of 296.2. The RL-10B has a liquid hydrogen fuel and a liquid oxygen oxidizer, and its specific impulse is 465.5. The Merlin 1D has rocket grade kerosene, or RP1, and has an oxidizer of, again, li liquid oxygen. Its specific impulse is 275. And finally, there is the Raptor, which plans to use liquid methane and has a specific impulse of 334. So some things that we want to go over is that UH25 and is, is a chemical, and it, this fuel can stay stable at room temperature. However, if there is a leak, and if the crew is uh, in contact with it, it can be deadly. And then there's also the liquid hydrogen. It's a highly efficient engine, but the one main issue is that the propellant must remain liquid at the whole time that it's in transit to Mars, and that would be quite difficult because the temperatures reach down to negative 259 degrees Celsius to 252 degrees Celsius for the hydrogen and oxygen as well. The RP-1 is another choice that we considered. However, the oxidizer must be super chilled at negative 340 degrees Celsius. The propellant also degrades over time. As it, we mentioned, it is rocket gate great kerosene. And finally, with the Raptor, we decided not to go with that because it is still in development and the engine has not, it is still going, it is still going through some testing, but we aren't confident in using that yet. And so we'll run down through the masses. So Vicus 4B has around five, 900, in, 900 kilograms. The thrust is, gives about 805,000 newtons, and the thrust to ratio is 894. The RL-10B2 has a mass of 301 kilograms. Its thrust is 110,000 newtons. And that gives our thrust to mass ratio of about 365. The Merlin 1D is about 470 kilograms. And the thrust is about 934,000 newtons. And that ratio is about 1,900. And again, the Raptor, we can't really give any specific numbers on that. So with all that in mind, we find out what the optimal amount of engines for our engine, for our lander is, and we decided to go with the Vicus because, uh, as mentioned before, the engine, the Merlin, the, uh, the RL-10B2, and the Raptor all have to keep the oxidizer and fuel at a very low temperature, and that would require a lot of energy, so we just decided to go with a hypergolic engine instead. Um, and also with the Vicus, the three Vicus 4B vacuum engines, uh, all three engines are capable of gimbling. So in case of descent, one engine should fail. The, in, the two, other, two other engines are capable of compensating for the fail engine. Now we will talk about the subsystems. One of the main subsystems is the navigation. And before we go into the Mars, Martian atmosphere, the spacecraft could use something called the deep space navigation used by NASA. Uh, to navigate and communicate throughout space. However, once it goes inside the margin atmosphere, the deep space navigation will not, no longer be available to navigate through Mars. So we'll, we will use the terrain relative navigation. This was proposed by Mars 2020 rover, and 
basically it uses the synthetic aperture radar and um, uh, cameras to map the surface of Mars. And by using the data uh, gathered by the sensors and comparing the map with the original uh, course, the spacecraft can decide whether to di divert the course if necessary to, um, to safely go and land. Now on to communication. We will use an HRT 440 X-band high rate transmitter, which is designed by General Dynamics. This will be able to transmit a minimum of 25 kilobytes per second of data at a frequency of 8200.5 megahertz. megahertz. Three antennas will, will be present on the land lander, two while it is in transit to Mars, which will then detach as the lander enters its aerobraking breaking phase, and one which will extend once the lander has actually landed on the surface of Mars. These, landers, these antennas will communicate with the Mars Reconnaissance or orbiter and use it to act as a relay to Earth. However, should the MRO be unfunctionable or should a accident happen, the expand rate radio transmitters will still be able to communicate with Earth, but at the lower transmit speed. Now onto the reactant control system. We will be using 18 R4D thrusters in the same configuration as the Dragon capsule. These thrusters will have 35 kilograms of fuel stored on board in four tanks with a total burn time of approximately 11 min minutes, which is well over what we need for this type of mission. And, in, and this entire system will have a dry mass of just over 97 kilograms. Going on to our power considerations, we will be using two Megaflex solar arrays, each with a diameter of 5.5 meters, which, which will provide approximately 25 kilowatts of power at the Martian sphere of, of influence, which is five kilometers, which is five kilowatts over the recommended amount by NASA. And this will be complemented by five lithium sulfur batteries, providing a total of 125 kilowatt hour storage capacity. And these batteries will have a mass of 150, kilo, of 150 kilograms. And as you can see by our power breakdown, the, communi the communication systems will be using a minimal amount of pa power. Most of it will be going into the life support systems, such as, uh, as, such as thermal protection, lighting, hy hygiene, and spacecraft can control systems will use up also a large percentage of the, of the power, followed by the terrain navigation equipment. And this will leave, leave us with a few kilowatts of extra power as a redundancy in case more power needs to be diverted to a certain system or the solar panels get damaged in any way. And to onto, and onto the protection systems. So first we will talk about the heat shield that will be used. We will, u we will be using the Pika X heat tiles. These are SpaceX's variant of the Pika, the Pika heat tiles. And they can experience up to a temperature of 1600 degrees Celsius. Then furthermore, we do have space, the space shuttle's heat blankets that will be lined inside the craft, and these will be used to absorb the heat and can endure up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 16, almost up to 16 degrees Celsius. And also with micrometeorite protection, there are th we considered three types of these, and these are used in the ISS. We decided to go with NASA's configuration where it's basically going to have two aluminum plates that will be offset from the lander's walls. And in between those aluminum plates, there will be Kevlar and Nextel and MLI. They will be spaced apart. And to the total spacing will be about 11.4 centimeters. Uh, for radiation detection, we decided to go with lighter, lighter hydrogen-based elements instead of heavier mass elements like lead but we went with water. Uh, in, our, in our materials research, we found that seven centimeters of water would be able to have radiation that's going through it. And doing some proportions, our limits were five centimeters and three centimeters for our design. And we ended up going with four centimeters of water, which would drop the, radi the incoming radiation by about 28 and a half percent. And this system would allow for 
about 0.18 sieverts of radiation being applied to the astronauts in a six months journey. And without it, it would only be as a safety feature. Like this, this is only to increase the safety of our crew. And so after, now that we've completed all three sections of our lander, we're going to move on to the mass breakdown. Um, so the, the primary system, the lander, the shell currently weighs about 12,000 kilograms. Um, our fuel is 76,000 kilograms. Our three Vicus 4B uh, vacuum engines are 2,700 kilograms. And the 10-ton kilo, ten payload of 10,000 kilograms. For our, our subsystems, the entire power, power system will be approximately 450 kil kilograms. The terrain nav navigation system would weigh approximately 200 kilograms. The communication systems, 130 kilograms. And the reaction control system will also have a mass of 130 kilograms, bringing our total to 910 kilograms approximately. And then finally, we have the mass breakdown for the protection of the lander. The radiation protection will be, will be about 9,700 kilograms. The heat shielding in total for both the Pika X tiles and the heat blankets will come up to 3,000 kilograms. And finally, with the micrometeorite protection, it will come up to about 110 kilograms, giving us the total for protection to be about 12,810 12, kilograms. And so taking the primary subs subsystems and protection systems, that will give our lander a total of 114,000 kilograms. And so we'll go into our build schedule. The first part of the build schedule will consist of the planning and design stage. This will take approximately six months and will in involve deciding on the window to launch as well as all other da data needed to be compiled in order to build the spacecraft such as, lo such as logistics and other types of planning. And then for tech development, there are a lot of unknowns involved in making into making this lander. For one, there isn't a lander that is available in, com in the commercial market for use. Thus, there needs to be a way to figure uh, what adjustments must be needed to ensure the lander will properly function and prevent casualties from happening. One example would be figuring out how to place the Pika X tiles into, con into a configuration that will cover the Icarus. In addition, there needs to be development of the terrain navigation system to ensure that our craft will be able to fire at the right amount of thrust at a certain time. If too little is put into the wrong height, the lander will face certain trouble. As a result, the extensive amount of time is needed to develop the technology for Icarus. Once the design is proved to be safe and passes all reviews such as critical design review, the systems, including electronic communications, navigation, the engines, the landing systems, would be tested to ensure that the software and hardware operates without any kind of malfunction. And during the testing phase of our technology, we will begin the construction of three things. The simulation, our flight test article, and the production model. Um, the simulation and the flight test article will then be tested with the technology. Moving on, and once that's been cleared, it will move on to the production model. So moving on to the spacecraft testing phase, this would be going on from March 26, 2024 to June 15, 2020, 2026. And what this is, is we want to make sure, we're sending people down on the surface, and we want to make sure that they're going to have a safe chance. So everything is going to be tested to its limits, just to, to make extra sure that they're going to be OK. After the completion of, of the simulator and the flight test article, the technology is going to be installed. For the final months of the schedule, uh, the final testing of all software and hardware will be finalized and uh, the payload will be moved to the uh, launching site. Now, so for the mission debrief. So our mission is going to be in four steps. It's going to be in a arrow breaking uh, maneuver uh, for a direct ascent of reentry. And then during that reentry, we will have a power descent into landing. So arrow breaking. You're probably wondering, why arrow breaking? Well, primarily, this strategy saves us about 115,000 kilograms worth of fuel, decreasing our mass by 52%. 
It also has a surprisingly minimal G load on the crew because the max deceleration they will experience will be less than 10% of 1G. When people think of air braking, I know sometimes they can think of, oh yeah, a craft slamming into the atmosphere, but it's more of a gradual pass through in order to slow it down. This is the equation we use, it's called the forget air braking equation. And what it is, is it tells you how much delta V the craft gets slowed down by after one pass around the, uh, around the atmosphere. It can apply to any body, and in this case, it's the atmosphere of Mars, which, even though it's not very dense, is actually suitable for an air braking maneuver. So some numbers for you. We chose the magic number at, for the periopsis at 98.686 kilometers. Now how we got this was we wrote a program based off of that equation and did a series of guess and check calculations and narrowed it down so that we would find the right height where the velocity, the, the, where the delta V that's shed off after one air braking pass at that altitude matches the delta V that's needed to get into an orbit at, at that altitude. And so the velocity when it would get there coming on from its hyperbolic trajectory would be 5.786 kilometers per second. And the delta V from the arrow braking is 2.288 2 kilometers per second. This would bring the craft to an orbital velocity of approximately 3.498 kilometers per second. Also, we have an extra 200 meters per second of fuel that can be used be, as a to give us a 9% margin of error because coming from the 2.288 kilometers per second that gets shut off. Shut off. And then, in addition, this is just kind of an extra safety net, although it's most likely not going to be necessary because we're going to put the Icarus in a 90 degree polar orbit, which will give us the most accurate delta V calculations. Keep in mind that air braking is not completely accurate, but this way we can ensure that it will be, especially because the Martian atmosphere can vary. Also, any future craft can choose any part of Mars to land on. We chose Hellas Planitia specifically. We'll go into that more later, but this is just for future missions. Here's the graph showing that, that the error as you approach 90, a 90 degree incli inclination. You can see we chose the, the red line is the equation we, we use. It's the simple one with a non-rotating non atmosphere. And originally, we were thinking of just doing a pretty flat equatorial orbit, but we saw that the error was more than 5%, and we didn't like that. So 90 degrees, it's not exactly zero, but it hovers in the 2% range. So on to the next phase is the descent to surface. So after re-entry, uh, we begin a coasting phase. Uh, this is a parametric, uh, parametric equation graph representing altitude versus horizontal distance traveled as a function of time. Um, and I wrote an algorithm on my computer that ca calculates its position off its last known coordinate, so how its altitude and its distance traveled. Um, and I can explain later, but this equation will map the first 194 seconds of descent. Next we, needed to f next, we needed to figure out a place to land our spacecraft, and we chose the Hellas Planitia region on Mars for a few reasons. First, it is relatively flat and is situated inside a two kilometer deep depression inside Mars, which gives us more time to slow down. In, in addition, it's one of the warmest parts on Mars, and as you can see by the graph, during the sum summer, the temperature can approach roughly 30 degrees Fahrenheit. 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and when, when considering the average te temperature of Mars, this is extremely warm and, and, will be an, an, and will be an incredibly habitable place for any human crew. In addition, the Hellas Planitia re region has been theorized to have glaciers made of ice underneath its surface, as well as accessible lo lava tubes for these astronauts, and so we feel that this is the best place to launch an expedition to Mars. At, as it could provide the most scientific da data, as well as the best chance, chances for a human crew to set up ha habitation. And so, during our planning, we were trying to figure out which is the best way to descend, and we figured that it could either be parachute, airbags, or power descent. So for, these are all based on the Mars Curiosity rover, and Initially, we thought we could use a parachute and then powered descent, but however, with further calculations, we found out that the air on Mars is way too thin, 
and there, we would not be able to slow down in enough time. We also considered airbags because the Curiosity rover landed with the assistance of airbags. However, we realized that bouncing around with these airbags being inflated would cause more stress on our human crew and it would also be expensive and a lot of labor to put it into the craft. Therefore, we op opted for power descent instead and it's optimal, it's optimal because it slows down in enough time with our engines. And we'll go into cost breakdown. We'll first go over the advanced mission cost model and then go into lender cost. Um, so we received this question, the system cost from the Johnson Space uh, Center for the advanced missions cost model. Um, with a, a, with a, quality, a quantity of six, so that includes one engineering development unit, one mock-up, one simulator, one ground test article, one flight test article, and one production vehicle. With, and also the, this also requires the knowledge of the dry mass of the vehicle in pounds. Um, and then the constant of which we are a planetary lander, so 2.46. Uh, the first year of which the system is operation, uh, 2027. And since this is the first iteration of this model, it is currently block one. And as this mission has never been ever done before, uh, we gave this a difficulty of two and a half, which is the maximum on the scale. And after uh, plugging in these numbers and constants given to us, uh, the price for this is $127 billion. But this price also includes everything. So this includes uh, all the subsystems and protection systems uh, being installed in the lander, all the man hours required for research and development, uh, every small cost outside of the fuel and the rockets. Uh, going back to that, while this may seem like an extremely large cost spread out over eight, eight years, then the the average NASA but the average NASA budget would only need to rise to approximately 0.6 percent of the entire U.S. budget, so it's relatively cheap. And this is and compare this to the cost of the Apollo program, where the average Na NASA budget before the first moon la landing was approximately three percent. So, so when, when, com when comparing this by the cost of overall percentage of our U.S. budget, it's actually one-third as cheap as the Apollo program. And so, as mentioned before, the lander is expensive. However, that does go over the cost in designing and then making further corrections. And it does include subsystems and protection systems. The fuel we counted to about 1.3 million. And finally, each of the rocket engines we found out, so the Vickis 4B, each cost 10 million US dollars. So a total of 30 million dollars. And that brings our total to about 127 billion, 31 million dollars. To summarize our presentation, the total mass of our lander is 114,000 kilograms. And many of, many of our parts are proven to be successful because they will be used and have been used before the year of 2026, such as the terrain relative navigation and the launch vehicle for Vicus 4B. And for our op operations, we have two main steps, which are air braking and power descent. This will all cost $127 billion. And finally, we will be able to create a working production model within eight years before 2026. This has been our presentation, and thank you for listening. So this time for questions. I've got a question. Can you tell me how you calculated your propellant mass? So what was your delta V that you assumed for descent? Um, in the rocket equation, we used a delta V of 3,500 meters per second. For, for the, when you're talking about aero braking, does that include going from the uh, trans-Mars injection trajectory in, into an orbit around Mars, or was it solely after you got into an orbit and then bringing that down? Right, so with, with the aero braking, it's basically just, we're going from the hyperbolic trajectory, going, setting our periopsis at 98 kilometers and making one pass, and that's going to give us an orbit. It's not going to be a perfect, perfectly circular orbit because it doesn't have to dip below the 98 kilometers, but it's, it's going to be pretty rough, and it's just, it's going to get us there. That's the, the, that's the point. Okay. Yeah, that, um, that's often called aero capture, but yeah. un understood. Um, 
And then it sounds like, you know, based on Tara's question, uh, you were assuming no aerodynamic uh, deceleration from orbit. You were just taking the orbital velocity uh, to compute the delta V. Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, it sounded like your delta V was three and a half kilometers per second. So the delta V from the aero brake is about. Sorry, a after the aero brake. Oh yeah, that the orbital velocity is going to be at three about three point five kilometers per second. Okay. Uh, so you, did you take a look at whether you could use um, continued aerodynamic deceleration to decrease that? Do you mean like just coasting down the atmosphere? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that that we're pretty much going to do that with the power descent because the heat shield, the the shape of it. And the fact that it's going to be going backwards is going to help us slow down a little bit. It's not going to do as much as the arrow braking, but it's, that's going to be part of it. Yeah, so I have a question. So uh, th then the attitude that your vehicle is entering is, is with the rocket engines going first, going into the atmosphere, and, and so that would be the area that you have to do aerodynamic braking? Yes, there would be going backwards right. and at a zero degree angle of attack. Okay. Also, one thing we didn't mention was that we would also, we considered having a rotating, having our craft rotate, sort of like cooking a chicken so that the heat wouldn't build up too much and that you could spread it around. So uh, 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 do, you, you have, uh, do you have thermal protection material on there and, and, and where is that located? Yeah, that was the the Pika X tiles located and, and, on, on the bottom. So, so, so the Pika X tiles are only on, they're on the bottom of the vehicle. They're not on the sides of the vehicle. Is that correct? Um, we do have heating protection on the sides of the vehicle. We are using the heat blankets used. Oh, okay. Our, okay, I, I think I understand now. Okay, thanks. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, how did you figure figure out how much water to use for radiation shielding? So we go, go ahead and answer that one. Um, wait, the thickness of the water or the volume of water required? The thickness. So when I was researching the materials, I found that I had to sacrifice the mass, uh, like the, I had to use, I had to sacrifice the mass in order to get within the requirements of the competition. So first I have wanted to go with lead, but the nice to that, yeah. that, that, that's what I yeah, soon discovered. Weird. So yeah, yeah. my final option was to try to research a, a lighter material, and I stumbled upon water. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a form that had calculations about how you can get it to, how you can get it so that a galactic cosmic radiation can be about the same radiation as you experience on Earth. And I found that seven centimeters of water can half radiation, half their radiation going through it. Okay, good. Um, and secondly, and maybe this is out of the scope, but uh, do you have something that could launch your payload, uh, your your spacecraft, for 114,000 kilograms? Is there a launcher capable of that? Did you address that? Um, in the prompt for this project, we were told we are entering the Martian sphere of influence with a speed of three kilometers per second, so it was not uh, given to us to include a launcher for this mission. I'd like to add in that I'm sure by the year 2026, we'll have heavier capabilities like the space launch system currently being developed by NASA or the BFR by SpaceX. As you were uh, considering the radiation shielding, uh, given that both that's water and it's really only of relevance for the crew configuration, uh, did you think as to whether or not you could actually count that towards the useful payload mass being delivered by the vehicle? We first thought we can count that for the 10 metric tons, but then we instead realized that what if the water is not, like you cannot use the water after it's been used as a shield. So we, we just ended up using it as its own separate uh, mass. Um, a hundred and twenty billion dollars is a lot of money. Um, it, it's, um, I, I'm just wondering if it struck you as curious that you came out with that number since that number is, um, 
for instance, about 100 times as much as the cost of development of the Falcon Heavy. Um, that well, do, wouldn't you suspect that maybe you made a math mistake? Well, we, we did do the calculation new, new, numerous times, and this is the answer we, we got. However, we would also like, like, to, like to point out that this is, has been adjusted for inflation to the year 2026, and also the Apollo pro program, when adjusted for inflation, was also $120 billion. So it is actually roughly extremely sim similar to the Apollo program in terms of cost. And also, like I have said, when, when you divide this over eight years, it's roughly $15 billion per year, which, it, which means that the NASA bu overall budget every year has to rise to only 0.6%, which, which is less than the NASA budget during the Apollo program, which was 3%. So this cost is actually very re reasonable and accurate. Are there any further questions? All right, thank you very much. This is the Polish team. Yes. Right. Speak Polish to me. Który to jest ten? Weź ci laptopa stąd. Hello everyone, I am Justine and I have a pleasure to introduce you Project Eagle Team. Today me and my friend Kacper, Krzysiu, Asia, Michał and Anja, with a little help of Grzesiu and Kacper, will tell you a little bit more about our project. We are a group of 16 students representing different fields of science mechanics, electronics, biologists, material engineers, and more. We are part of Student Scientific Association Off-Road, which focuses on space projects. Uh, Polish space program is developing, and we want to contribute to that. For this reason, we are uh, decided to challenge ourselves in different uh, kind of tasks, like creating Mars lander, uh, and to gain the experience uh, in space projects. For Red Eagle contest, we recruited the whole new team, which was managed by more experienced members of our uh, association, like me and Anya. Uh, and it was quite a challenge uh, compared to our previous projects because it required more specialistic knowledge in fields of science we had no previous experience in. Uh, we, uh, we started our work by dividing into two groups. Each of them had two months to prepare and design one uh, concept of Mars lander, modular, and one body. We wanted to have different points of view uh, to compare them and to choose the best one. Mm. We had our meetings at least two times a week to keep the information flow, uh, to discuss the progress, the problems, uh, to share the experience we gained, uh, and of course to avoid doubling the work. Mm. After all, uh, we designed and checked more than 10 different Mars landers concepts, uh, including the most craziest one like creating electromagnetic shield, to the last one we have pleasure to present to you today. Mm. One of the most crucial parts of our work was creating a good plan of work and milestones we had to achieve uh, in a specific time. We had to use uh, dedicated professional tools like 3D modeling programs, programs to analysis, and project management programs to design and analyze our project as exact as we can. Uh, we reached out specialists from professional institutions like ESA uh, because with their help we could make, um, make out best solutions. 
And now Kasper will tell you a little bit more about our Mars lander. So, uh, our final concept is a um, unibody Mars lander, which uses two forms of deceleration. Uh, the first one is our braking uh, deceleration module, which is basically Hayat, uh, and the second one are rocket engines. Uh, to obtain the best uh, volume to size ratio, we've decided to design our lander uh, as a cylinder with a beveled cone on top. Uh, and its dimensions are 8.2 meters in diameter and 15 meters in total height. Uh, with, and it weights, uh, the dry mass of, of our lander is about uh, 24 tons. Adding 4 tons of propellant and uh, 10 tons of payload, we are ending uh, with a total mass of uh, 38 tons. Uh, uh, one of the crucial parts of designing a space vessel uh, is to obtain the lowest possible overall mass without loss of necessary uh, durability. And to achieve this goal, uh, we've decided to use a stressed skin supporting structure uh, construction, as you can see on the screen. And, and uh, in this construction, the mine strain is carried down on the truss and the outer layer provides uh, stability and isolates the insides of our lander. And of course, uh, we wanted to be sure that this construction will meet its requirements. So we've made several finite elements analysis uh, so we could optimize the shape of the truss and the sizes of, of the ribs. Uh, and the, the main parts of the supporting structures are the square cross-section of 50 by 50 millimeters uh, ribs and plates going up through the whole cylinder, as you can see. Uh, and we also have a shell going around the whole outer layer of our lander. And the, the first uh, part of our shell from the outside are the effort side ties, uh, because we're using uh, two forms of uh, deceleration that uh, makes a lot of heat, so we wanted to, have, to be sure that we have some thermal protection. Uh, and those tiles are applied on the thin aluminum layer, uh, which covers a layer of an isolation foam. And uh, as this isolation foam, we have chosen BM265, since the, its properties are well examined for now, and, and we, we, we've decided that's the best option. And that's all, the, the foam is uh, co connected to the uh, carbon epoxy composite, which, which is connected to the outer layer of a supporting structure, uh, which is made of aluminum alloy. And I forget to mention that the whole supporting structure is made of titanium alloy. And that's basically uh, our engineering part uh, in a nutshell. Thank you. Okay. So now something about landing. In order to reduce mass, uh, we decided to rely mainly on aerobraking and our atmospheric deceleration module, uh, abbreviated ADM, is based on the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator currently in development by NASA. The ADM consists of obviously two parts, uh, the <coughs> inflatable structure, 22 meters in diameter, and the rigid nose housing all the necessary electronics and nitrogen tanks used for inflation. Uh, we considered the uh, use of the asymmetrical Hyatt, but concluded that if the simple solution works, there is no need for uh, additional R&D cost, costs. Uh, the whole module is attached directly to the lander's legs with explosive bolts, which eliminate, eliminates need for an adapter, which further reduces mass. Uh, and after the aero braking phase, uh, the module is detached and the power descent phase uh, begins. Okay, so the problem with engines is that there is no engine currently in use or in development that would suit our needs. You could use an engine like RD58 that uses kerosene and oxygen, but this is not a good, good long-term solution if you want to use methane that could, could be produced on Mars. 
So we decided to uh, base our design on the 3D printed demonstrator engine currently in development by NASA. Uh, the, the engines, uh, as I previously said, would use methane and oxygen mixture and operate in a gas generator cycle. Uh, the 3D printing technology allows for redu allows reduced uh, R&D and production costs. The uh, reaction control system is composed of a simple pressure-fed uh, thrusters, mainly for reliability reasons, and they use the same propellants as the main engines. Our fuel tanks uh, will be made from the woven carbon composite and are the central element of our unified fuel system that simplifies the construction, uh, reduces the overall lander's mass, and probably allows for a more flex flexible mission profile. Our landing gear is responsible for uh, three things. Obviously, the safe touchdown, acting as an adapter for the ADM, and maintaining enough room uh, for the, uh, under the lander for the cargo bay to, to lower. The, they are constructed in such a way that they could adapt to the uh, Martian terrain. Uh, the main energy dispersion, dispersing element is the honeycomb structure at the base of the legs. Asha, something about life. In our lander, we decided to implement convertible cargo unit, and thanks to this, we can use in both type of mission. It's manned and unmanned mission. So, um, first of all, our cargo bay is cuboid, and its dimensions are four by four by eight meters. And after landing, the cargo is being extracted on an elevator platform, as you can see on the screen. And uh, the size of uh, cargo, which can be unloaded at once, is 64 cubic meters. Um, in our design, we create the opportunity to put the astronauts on, on board the lander. Uh, however, it's optional because, in our opinion, it will not be safe before, before 2026 because available technology will not be advanced enough. However, we can. Uh, However, we can take uh, the, replace the cargo bay and put the manned module inside. Uh, and uh, our lander can store uh, supplies for 10 months of mission for, for astronauts. On your, your right, you can see how our life support system on board the lander looks like. And it consists of four main subsystems. And it's atmosphere revitalization subsystem, water management subsystem, heat transfer subsystem, oxygen supply and boarding pressure control subsystem. So first of all, our water recovery subsystem, it's partially closed loop, which means that we can recover water from urine, from cleaning and from air conditioning, but not from the feces. And um, the water is pumped back to the temperature control subsystem and utilized for cleaning purposes. On board, we have also four emergency tanks, uh, which uh, can be used as a potable water for the astronauts. To provide oxygen, we, we use a dedicated generator, and similar to water, we have three tanks in case of emergency. Uh, we have also a filtration system to remove uh, contaminations, bacteria, fungi, and water from the air, and to preliminary remove carbon dioxide and uh, metabolic gases such as methane, benzene, benzene uh, ammonia, etc. We decided to use algae. We, we, we choose this, this solution because algae is great, is accessible source of uh, micro and micro elements for the astronauts, and the green color is proved to be relaxing for humans. And according to this, the walls inside our lander have also bright colors. So in our concept, pre-cooked food provides more than half <coughs> daily energy requirements. And we decided to add to diet um, uh, edible bags as a source of proteins and calories. And uh, as mentioned before, algae as a source of vitamins, micro and micro 
elements. We choose two types of bugs, and it's Dubia cockroaches and Hermetia larvae. And Hermetia can be fitted with plastic food pack can be fitted with plastic food packaging, and we can use them as a source of food for, for Dubia cockroaches and for the astronauts. On this slide, you can see how our manned module looks like, and the entire area of this module is 80 cubic meters, and uh, this module consists of two decks. On the first deck, we have insects breeding facilities, sleeping compartment with two beds, bathroom with a shower, toilet, workout equipment, and food storage. And on the upper deck, we have computer subsystem, seats, and two storages, the first one for food and the second one for equipment. And uh, now Michal will tell you something more about electronics on board our lander. Okay. Okay, so we found that if we want to show avionics design in our lander, uh, we have to divide the spar into the smaller problems. As you can see, uh, we were managed to um, specify the following sections like the steering system, guidance, power management and supply, and the communication. Uh, while designing avionics in our lander, we uh, took into cons consideration the previous uh, Mars missions and the other, both success uh, successful and those with, uh, ended with the failure, uh, from which we learned the most. Uh, power supply and storage. So, uh, while solar panels uh, seem to be a good choice for a, a spaceship, we assume that um, for our lander have to be uh, useful not just in space but on the Mars planet as well. And therefore, we decided to use uh, advanced steering radioisotope generators, uh, which can strengthen the whole construction of the lander and. Uh, provide power supply for all uh, devices. Uh, ASRG is uh, NASA technology uh, that not only would uh, supply, lower the cost of the future uh, Mars missions, but also uh, it can provide enough power uh, for uh, more missions in one time. <coughs> uh, for the navigation in space, uh, response the deep space positioning system uh, which allows us to determine exact position of the uh, spaceship in the solar system. And uh, the deep space atomic clock uh, is responsible for the accurate time measurements, uh, which are automatically synchronized, uh, which automatically synchronize received sent uh, radio time signal. And uh, the separate part of the DPS are the micro star trackers and the uh, high sensitivity cameras, uh, which uh, these devices can recognize stars and planets around the uh, spacecraft. And uh, in the entry descent uh, landing stage, uh, we decided to use IMUs, uh, lidars, radars, and landing cameras. Of course, uh, each device with the proper redundancy. Uh, okay, and now our feature, which is the printed electronics. Mm, so the production of costs are really low and uh, the printed electronics could be thin and simultaneously flexible. Uh, and uh, um, present most of the um, sensor used in the space industry uh, could be um, printed in this technology. And uh, it is said that to, uh, to 2020, all of uh, necessary parts uh, will be uh, available. And uh, the advantage of this technology is that the astronauts can uh, design and uh, manufacture, simply manufacture uh, the new electronic boards in space or uh, on the Mars planet and replace the damaged parts of the lander or uh, create the new one uh, or for the another devices. Okay. So as for the organization of the mission, 
the biggest challenge for us was probably the uh, planning of the mission and creating the wholesome budget. That's why we contacted a specialist working for European Space Agency, and with his, and with his help, uh, we organized a workshops focused on managing a professional managing of such a big space endeavor. And then we started with creating a risk analysis. We thought about and written down every malfunction or accident that could occur at every stage of our mission. Uh, and we also uh, compared that to the solution we used uh, uh, previous in our, in our design and made sure to include the new ideas into the final form. Uh, to conclude the whole risk analysis, we also scored the uh, malfunctions by its probability, uh, severity and uh, uh, and ability to detect them, and uh, that's how we find out that the most crucial, crucial uh, of the risks that we listed would be for sure the uh, electronic system failure and also the SLS not being ready on time, uh, and we could f thought about the uh, backup plans to reduce the risks. Then when, after we uh, in included the risk analysis outcome into our uh, final design, we moved on to the planning. First, we set the uh, date of our launch to December 2026, because that's the closest to the optimal window given the rules of the competition. Uh, then for the rest of the planning, we uh, used the uh, NASA's uh, system engineering handbook, because we had little to no experience in that kind of big space mission planning. Uh, with its help, we managed to divide our mission into seven phases. And the longest part would be the uh, elements manufacturing and also the final integration of the system taking place in the phase C and phase D. Together with the launch in phase E, it would take about four years. So that's the uh, biggest amount of time. Uh, we also estimated the time for the flight and for the both data uh, data collection and data analysis to about a year each. And then as for the budget, we set the budget at around $8 billion. Uh, we base it on the assumption, uh, we base our assumptions on the other well-known missions. That's because we didn't, uh, we couldn't acquire most of the cost of special technologies and uh, also materials because they were simply classified, especially for the foreigners. Uh, then we also take into consideration the fact that, for example, the redundancy that we use for our electronic systems would double some of the expenses, but on the other hand, it would also increase the safety of our, of our mission. On the other hand, we decided to use as little as possible of the new technologies because uh, its implementation would cost us big time and it still could end in the failure, with the failure. And, uh, and we set our priority on the safety of the mission and usage of well-known tested, uh, tested technologies. So on the slides, you can see the, uh, uh, there are presented the charts comparing amounts of funds used on every part of our mission. The electronics and also the mission organization. Thank you. We are glad we took on the task of designing to designing Mars lander that is that is capable to land on the surface of the Mars with 10 tons of payload. Uh, we had amazing opportunity to learn new things in fields of science you had no previous experience in, uh, to gain the experience in space projects, and of course to talk to specialists from professional institutions like ESA. Uh, we are sure that we will use new skills in our future space projects, and we hope that there will be more contests like this one, because we are really proud of progress that we made in a short period of the time. Uh, we I'd like to thank, thank to all people engaged in our project, including specialists from CERN, Mass Society, Polska and ISA. And of course, we'd like to thank to all our sponsors, because without uh, their help, we couldn't be here to present our work. So high five for a team work. Yeah. And that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy it. And feel free to ask us anything. All right. We have... Uh a good amount of time for questions. Uh, so I'll just start off. So uh, first of all, I'd just like you to review for me 
the mission sequence, you know, how you get from interplanetary uh, trajectory to the surface of Mars. And the other question I had was, um, at one point I believe you said that the uh, aero shell, the inflatable aero shell, was 22 meters in diameter and that the uh, uh, lander itself was 15 meters tall, yet in the artwork that you showed, it, it seemed like they were almost the same size, but um, maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, if you could clarify the mission sequence and uh, also, did you do any analysis showing that the hot wake from the aero shell would miss the lander? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the best trajectory, uh, the best option would be uh, the direct entry, but considering the uh, competition rules. We had to think about humans first. And so uh, our, our physicists cal calculated that we should, first of all, use either air capture or enter the silicon orbit by, the, uh, by using the orbital engines, which are part of the RCS system. And from that, we, we would uh, start the proper arrow breaking and entry and descent. So, so tell the story. What did you... How okay. does it go? Okay. Explain okay. it. What for this report? Yeah. Okay. Just give us a second. We have to open our final report, where the all the all the pictures. So. In the meantime, um, given that you have uh, a nearly full propellant tank on top of a structure that's almost as tall as it is wide, with a high at the front, how confident are you that this structure is aerodynamically stable? Uh, to be honest, when it comes to aero braking, I wouldn't be 100% sure, but when it comes to power descent, I, I think it should be fine. Okay, so the plan is uh, to acquire the or, uh, circular orbit around Mars mainly by uh, by using the orbital engines and after that we would uh, try to enter the atmosphere so okay so j just walk me through it you're coming to mars from yes. interplanetary trajectory and you're capturing into orbit using rocket propulsion is that correct uh, or are you using the aero brake are you aero capturing or rocket capturing well actually both uh, no both because uh uh, the, the plan is to use aero braking for to ac to acquire elliptical orbit and then cir circularize it, and from that we could. So you're uh, aero braking into, uh, you're yes. aero capturing into Mars yes. orbit. Yes. And then you are then after that you're coming in use the aero shell to slow down and then rockets to land. Yes. All right. That that just clarifies my question. And then the question about. Uh, the whether the hot wake from uh, you know that's coming around the side of the aero shell does it hit the the uh, lander or not? Well, considering the height of our lander, uh, definitely uh, the FRSI tiles are necessary. So the lander the thermal will protection on the side of the lander because yes, yes, the wake will will yeah, hit it. Exactly. Okay, got it. Yeah. Tell me again. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you tell me again the total cost? I was trying to add up the numbers real quick, but what was the total? It was like the seven and a half billion. The total cost uh, is uh, around eight billion dollars. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, could I don't know if you can pull up something where you can see the landing legs? Um, oh, okay. And in part, maybe one with the heat shield, and then you also had the one landed. Um, when they're on the attached to the heat shield like that, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you would uh, deploy the, the heat shield, the aerodynamic decelerator, uh, relative to the vehicle, and then? Okay. All right. So that's the the leg deployment. How how do you uh, get rid of the aerodynamic decelerator, the inflatable structure? Uh, could you repeat the question? Oh, okay. Uh, well, 
we're using the explosive bolts first, of, uh, obviously, and uh, in the meantime, the engines are are, uh, are started, and the power descent begins, you could say, exactly at the moment of the ADM detachment. Okay, and then in terms of landing gear, did you look at uh, tangential loads? So if the vehicle was moving sideways, uh, to some extent, how that would affect the legs with that design? Uh, well, not much. We, cons we assumed that since we have four en engines for redundancy and we could hover using only two, that uh, there should, shouldn't be any significant tangential forces. Okay, uh, I think there was also a comment in the power systems about with the ASRG Something about it strengthening the structure. Uh, could you repeat the question? Well, I, in part, I wanted to know if I understood what you said. But the advanced Sterling radioisotope yeah, yeah. generator, I yeah. uh, thought you made some comment about the structure. I was just wondering what that was. Uh, so? uh, okay, so uh, because the solar panels. Um, are uh, the, not the strongest part of the uh, lander, so um, and this is why uh, the SRG are the strongest one, because we hide them in the uh, lander, so um, when we got the solar panels, we had to uh, do something uh, with them in the space before the landing, and that, that was the uh, from. Okay, thanks. Okay. See, so I've got two questions. Um, how bad was the power requirement to keep the methane and oxygen liquid on your way to Mars? Is that a major impact to your power budget? Okay, so um, how much energy? So uh, we. Um, do all the calculations, but we, we didn't uh, put it in here. Uh, we uh, mm, so the the S ASRG is about mm, twenty six percent of the uh, efficiency, and, and the another uh, energy is the uh, heat, and uh, we wanted just to. Uh, passive cooling uh, uh, to do the passive cooling of it, and uh, that's it, I think. Okay. I also have a question about there's something about a length of mission of 10 months. Was that only 10 months on the surface that you were going to support the crew? We did some, we did the calculation, and because of the area of uh, our lander is limited, so the area for food and any other equipment it's also limited, and uh, according to to, to this, uh, it. So we we get that the tenth mission is the best. Uh, option because we can't storage fo food for for more than ten mission. Also, water and oxygen. If we want to have re some redundancy, like these tanks with water and with oxygen, and um, also uh, because uh, we are thinking about mission longer than ten months, it's good to have um, to produce food on board, n not like. Uh, as using cockroaches or something like that, but uh, some plants and uh, the again area of of our lander is too small to do this, and we don't didn't ha don't have equipment to do this on sur on Mars surface. So uh, the ten ten months of mission looks like the best option for us, and because of also because of psychological reasons, because we have. Uh, something about six months of uh, trip from Earth to Mars, and again uh, from Mars to uh, to Earth, uh, under, uh, under six months, and uh, on the surface, surface ten months. It and it's actually almost two years of mission, 
and um, it's actually we didn't have any information about how our uh, body can change during so uh, that long mission so uh, it's the the lo uh, so I, uh, when we uh, summarize summarize all these things uh, we decide to to the, we decide that the 10 months is the, the maximal the maximal option for, for, for this mission. And I don't know, is it clear, clear for you? Well, I'm understanding your reasoning, but uh, my, also my understanding is it takes <clears throat> six months to get to Mars at the best, and then you have to wait a year and a half or 18 months <laughs> before you can come back. So the requirement of this content Very well, thanks. Thank you. Uh, one more question. I apologize if I missed it in the presentation, but did you give a total mass for your vehicle? Uh, yeah. Well, yes, the total mass was uh, around uh, 38 tons. Thank you. With fuel, uh, wet. wet, and with payload. And what is the total mass? 24. Uh, 24 tons. What, what are the triangles at the bottom of the landing legs for? Uh, actually they, <clears throat> well, uh, these triangles, uh, the thing is that our first idea uh, to attach the ADM to the legs was to use the clamps at the end of the legs. And our friend that was responsible for, for the legs uh, forget, forgot to remove them from the final Model, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, you have the the, the uh, rather large aero shell. What speed does that aero shell get you down to before you drop it, and then you're propulsive after that? Uh, we assumed that the part descent would start around Mach 2, 2.5. Two so it takes, it takes you to Mach 2, and then you power off of it and, and yes. land from there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And do you, do you know what altitude that, that occurs at? As far as I remember, it was around 10 to 15 kilometers. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the, the judges? All right. Then thank you very much. Okay.